Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Mr. Spahn, good morning and greetings from the German Medical Association in Berlin. I would like to warmly welcome you to the conference Doctors Going Digital, How to Future-Proof Skills, which has been co-organized by the Standing Committee of European Doctors and the German Medical Association. The organizers would especially like to thank the German EU Council Presidency for incorporating this conference into the associated program. We all wish that this meeting could have been held under different circumstances and that we could have had the opportunity to exchange our thoughts and experiences in person. However, given that this conference is dedicated to the digital skills of physicians, I find it more than fitting that it is being hosted virtually by organizations representing the medical profession. By the end of the conference, we will be able to assess whether we have passed this test of our digital skills. Today's conference highlights the potential of digital change. A purely digital conference with participants from more than 30 European countries would have been technically unthinkable until a few years ago. But the corona pandemic has also made it clear to us how necessary this transformation was. Minister Spahn will probably agree with me that the health sector in Germany has not necessarily been a pioneer of digital change. But the pandemic has also led to an even stronger trend toward digitalization in the healthcare sector. One example of this in Germany has been the rapid increase in remote treatment. Something that was held up for many years, partly owing to legal concerns, suddenly seemed to work without any problems. Patients' expectations are changing accordingly. And we as physicians must adapt to the increased demand for digital services in patient care. Today's conference will focus on the question of which skills a physician should have in order to be prepared for the increasing digitalization of medicine. Preparation for this must start in medical training. If we look at how digital skills are taught to physicians, I believe there are three key questions we should consider. Firstly, before we can determine which skills are needed, we must first discuss the challenges facing physicians. So the question we must ask ourselves is what exactly awaits physicians in this world of digital medicine? What are the technical changes and opportunities they must adapt to? Only after taking stock of these challenges can we begin to assess which skills physicians will have to acquire to meet them. Secondly, after considering these technical aspects, the second question must be about the ethical boundaries of practicing digital medicine. The more digital medicine becomes, the more we must be careful as doctors not to lose sight of our patients. If we look at this in terms of training, this means that when we are teaching digital skills, we must also ensure that the use of technology in medicine does not become an end in itself. Thirdly, we will have to address the question of what role physicians will play in the future. I hazard a guess that they will become even more crucial, precisely because of these digital changes. But they may have play a different role. Imparting digital skills must therefore also take into account the changing role of physicians. It is possible that this will also place unique demands on fundamental medical skills like communication and empathy. It's also possible that competences considered to be central to traditional, to traditional medical practice, like taking a patient's medical history or making a di diagnosis, will have to be reassessed as medicine becomes increasingly digital. We will now have the great privilege of hearing the introductory remarks of Minister of Health Jens Spahn for the EU Council Presidency and of Michel Servo from the European Commission. The presentations will, be, will expound upon the first question I've referred to here 
and provide us with insights into some of the challenges posed by digital medicine. Following this, we would like to address the question of how these challenges must be reflected in medical education. For this, we are pleased to welcome experts from a broad range of fields who have agreed to join us as panelists today. But you, your, our participants, are just as key to the success of this conference. I would like to encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to play an active role in this discussion. For the conference organizers, it was of utmost importance that we refrain from carrying out this essential discussion exclusively from the perspective of physicians. For these reasons, we are especially pleased that Professor Claudia Schmidtke, the German federal government's Commissioner for Patients Affairs, has joined us today to present the patient's perspective on digital changes in the healthcare system. On behalf of the organizers, I wish you an insightful and compelling conference, and thank you all for joining us today. And now it's my great honor and privilege to introduce Federal Minister of Health, Jens Spahn, who will speak to you about digital medicine and the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Spahn, the floor is yours. Mr. President, dear Mr. Reinhardt, thank you very much for holding an event on, on such an important topic in these days. This event is part of the associated program of Germany's presidency of the Council of the European Union. As such, it has a special status of an official EU 2020 event. In Europe, the coronavirus continues to determine the agenda. That is why fulfilling the resulting tasks, both nationally and regionally, is above all a shared European challenge, in which we try to help each other and learn from one another. Within the framework of the German Council Presidency, our goal is to strengthen healthcare structures so that we can find better and more sustainable responses to future pandemics and other health emergencies, together and coordinated, and, where necessary, also targeted and differentiated. Here, as in other areas of healthcare, digitalization and, especially data sharing, offers great opportunities. As the start of our Council Presidency in July, when we were discussing the priorities for this half year, Digital health was a major topic, improving sharing and access to health data for research and innovative healthcare. The basis for a high quality exchange of data and information is a common European data space with trustworthy rules and interoperable infrastructures. How can it be that persons, goods and viruses can cross borders, but health data remains trapped within national borders in Europe? Just imagine what would have been possible if we already had a fully functional European health data space in early 2020, with high quality and comparable health data. What a difference would this have made to outbreak surveillance, vaccine development, and the treatment of COVID-19. We want a space governed by rights and values, and for that we need to develop a common European regulatory framework, and I already said earlier in this presidency, working on a legal base on a regulatory framework is perhaps a bit boring compared to all the debates we have on technologies uh, and, and their progress, but it is necessary, might be boring, but necessary to go deep into the regulatory framework and to find one that actually applies for all 27 European countries. That's the only chance by the way, we have to really compete with the US and China if we are all together in this and are sharing data European-wide. We need a European health data space with a common understanding on how to access, share, and process health data safely in an ethical, sound manner. The pandemic demonstrates the benefits of digitalization in healthcare. It is a driver of innovation and digital transformation, boost of digital applications, boost of telemedicine using video consultation. Surveys report that patients' openness for digital technologies is high, and an increasing number of physicians are also becoming more open. The president just mentioned it. I remember medical conferences not so long ago, where when I mentioned the word telemedicine, the reception was a 
all but friendly and the reactions quite skeptical. Actually, most people were sitting like this, listening to me and not too long ago. And so I'm very happy that you just mentioned the rapid increase we have seen in using uh, telemedicine and uh, online treatment in the past months. The pandemic shows also clearly that when it comes to e-health, there is still much to be done. In other EU member states, digital technologies that had long been considered impossible here are already part of everyday medical care. But we realize this and have achieved a great deal during the past years. Most doctors' practice are connected to the telematic infrastructure. Pharmacies and hospitals are also on track. More institutions and health professions will follow. A fast track for digital health applications apps on prescriptions has been established. Every doctor can prescribe them and every insured person can use them. And we, as far as we know, were the first in the world actually having this approach. The ele electronic patient record will be launched in 2020 and on a request will place health data in the patient's own hands. Paperless, transparent and safe. From 2023, patients will be able to release treatment data from the electronic patient record for research purposes. Further examples, electronic docu documentation of long-term care and e-prescription. People have confidence in the benefits of well-made digital solutions. This is precisely what the Corona Warning app has shown. We launched the German Corona Warn app in summer. It has so far been downloaded by almost 23 million people, which makes it one of the most widely used coronavirus tracing apps Worldwide, And by the way, from the very beginning, uh, we have had an open source approach, which gave trust to the digital community. Of course, I myself also use the warning app. When I found out I was infected with COVID-19, I was able to quickly and reliably warn my context to protect more people. As is already the case in other areas of the working world, digitalization will change the medical professions. Digital consult consultations will not replace in-person medical treatment. It is possible that only real patient contact is able to fully render the image of a human being in all its complexity. However, digital consultation is a useful complement to direct contact. In other words, a sort of hybrid solution. The use of telemedicine applications and artificial intelligence in medicine gives doctor more time to spend with patients. And, by the way, because these days we discuss a lot about testing and testing possibilities, it will change the relation between doctors and patients in the 20s, I'm quite sure. We are discussing now home testing, not yet there, but will be there soon, I'm very sure, home testing uh, for SARS-CoV-2, coronavirus, uh, while toothbrushing, for example, like toothbrushing ev every morning. Uh, but that is actually a first test and I'm very sure we will see soon that actually patients, people, citizens can test themselves every day several times if they want to at home with blood, uh, with urine, with whatever liquid is used for it. And that, of course, will change the relation between patient and doctor because now to get a test and to get a lab a result, you need to see the doctor. He takes the liquid, sends it to the lab, the lab sends it back, you go to see your doctor again and get the result uh, uh, and what might be seen in it. And that will change, and that will change a lot, and I'm quite sure it will be so soon. So that needs a debate as well, uh, how this is changing the special relation. The use of telemedicine applications and artificial intelligence in medicine will also require greater digital skills. For me, this includes the ability to use the possibilities and communication offered by digitalization, ensure the highest possible data protection and data security, while always focusing on the real benefit for patients. Because that is what it must be about, digitalization for the good of the people. I'm pleased that, together with the European Association, the Standing Committee of European Doctors, the German Medical Association, the Bundesärztekammer is addressing this topic so intensely and has also dedicated today's event to it. The coronavirus pandemic is set to become a catalyst of digital transformation. The healthcare system in Germany and the world 
are making the public at large realize, probably for the first time, in what ways digitalization can help improve healthcare. Digitalization makes things easier, opens up free spaces, and brings new insights. Digital technologies will make our already good healthcare system even better. When doctors and patients experience this in their everyday life, trust in the use of digital technologies will increase. This pandemic challenges above all doctors who are contributing their medical knowledge and skills under difficult framework conditions. Day after day, you are proving to be the anchors of stability in our healthcare system all over Europe. For this, you all have my heartfelt gratitude. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Spahn, for this inspiring uh, introduction into our meeting. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Ulrich Montgomery. I am president of the Standing Committee of uh, Doctors in the European Union. And uh, I have the pleasure and the honor to moderate this discussion and to lead you through this morning's event. In the next two and a half hours, we will have the opportunity to continue the debate and we have a, quite a high number of high-level uh, experts with us from national and EU policy, from academia, from continuing medical uh, development, and from patients and medical students. We invite you to contribute uh, to the discussion and send us uh, your questions, both via chat and on Twitter. And you can use the hashtag, hash CPME digital skills. And while we are waiting for your questions to come in, I will pose the first question to Minister Spahn. And I will be a little bit on the boring side with you, because you started off with the European Health Data Space, which is a big topic in CPME. And uh, we don't think it's boring. It has to be resolved. And I would just like to hear, what is your vision with it? Who is the stakeholder? Who is the owner of the data? And how can we use this uh, in, pre in everyday present medicine in Europe? Minister Spahn. Thank you very much. Actually, I don't find it boring, but I see that, of course, I mean, of course, talking about digitalization and new technologies, everyone just sees the new applications, uh, uh, the, the real technique, and that is, of course, uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, but nevertheless, this all needs a good regulatory framework. And of course, talking about um, all these sentences and how you formulate it is a bit more boring than seeing the technique itself. But nevertheless, we do need to come and uh, uh, ground for it, actually, within the GDPR. Uh, we want to develop a code of conduct for healthcare that actually applies for all 27 member states. Because right now, uh, we are competing with the US, with China, with other big markets. Uh, and we are only strong enough if we are together in this with all 27. And if startups, for example, or big companies, whoever, as a stakeholder, is engaged in digital health in Europe, uh, if we give them the possibility uh, and actually the legal certainty that what they do applies in all 27 member states the same way. And that is not the case yet. By the way, even not in Germany, we do have 16 federal, federal states with 16 different approaches. That's a subject which we discuss on uh, yeah, quite often. But uh, <laughs> that is an issue, obviously. Uh, and so what we have started during our, actually already before the beginning of our presidency, and what we will continue to work at together with the Commission and other member states is to uh, develop this code of conduct that really is um, uh, an obligatory uh, legal base for healthcare data use. That is what we need in all 27 member states the same way. Most uh, uh, companies, stakeholders engaged in digital health in Europe don't say, please, no regulation. They say, give us cert certainty about what applies and what not uh, for me. Uh, and so actually, that's the precondition for all that might follow, and especially, as I said, in this competition we have with the US and China. I don't want to have to choose between Apple and Alibaba when it comes to health technologies. I want them to be developed here in Europe and in Germany. Yes, I think that's a very interesting uh, answer, and uh, I, I would just like to, to, to sort of look a little bit further. I mean, the European health data space also is correlated to uh, to uh, augmented intelligence, um, and uh, do we need some sort of ethical regulation on the algorithms which uh, are behind the EU health data space and, uh, and uh, augmented intelligence? Because we as doctors, uh, we want to have a final product as end users, which we can then use, like 
like a drug. And we do not have a special litigation or liability problems with it. Is there an, a vision on how we can formulate an ethical boundaries to uh, augmented intelligence and the EU health data space? And of course, is the medical profession involved in this? Uh, you're always involved, as you know, uh, and, 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 and we are happy that you are, by the way, because uh, we need this knowledge uh, uh, and these experiences from, from uh, everyday practitioning, actually. Um, of course, we do need a, a, a legal framework for that, too, because of uh, ethical reasons, but it needs a, a legal framework for liability uh, reasons as well. Um, for example, I mean, take a very easy example, uh, a diabetes app that gives a hint and advice, whatever, however you want to name it, to the patient, um, uh, which shall be uh, the, the concrete dose of insulin today for this certain situation that he is in. Uh, that is more or less a medical advice that would normally be given by a doctor. Who is actually liable if this is wrong and leads uh, to health problems? Uh, 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 and of course, for that, we need to regulate the algorithms and we need to find ways, which is difficult, by the way, but nevertheless, uh, need to find uh, ways like we did for drugs uh, years, decades, kind of centuries ago, yeah. step by step, it developed. Uh, uh, we need to develop uh, the same uh, for, for apps and, and technical uh, AI and all the, the technical innovations we will see, definitely. And we have to be sure that it's without bias, because uh, uh, especially some technical, some That's industry true. is very much behind these uh, but the bias, technical solutions. But the bias, Mr. Montgomery, is there in the real world too, always. Yeah, we all live in a biased world. This but we why, want to minimize this it. Is, yes. This is why I asked you to integrate the medical profession into your vision. Now, we have two questions uh, from listeners in. And the first uh, question comes from Heidrun Gitter. Heidrun Gitter is vice president of the German Medical Association, and she is a children's a child surgeon in Bremen, and she is now putting her question. Heidrun, please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, good morning, Mr. Spahn. Back to the European Health Data Space. Um, that certainly offers uh, huge potential um, for um, medical research and improving uh, medical health uh, within Europe. Um, but um, we need to ensure that the data entered into the health data space have the required quality and are only used according to scientific standards. And at the same time, these data must be secured against improper or not intended use. So you uh, already mentioned regulatory um, framework. How does the German Ministry of Health support the reliability and safety of these data? Well, actually, um, what we are, and, and frankly spoken, of course, the first approach is, in this case, again, a national one, because first of all, we need to finally manage it in, in Germany. But from the very beginning, we are thinking the European and international dimension as well. So we want to standardize by law uh, the interoperability, uh, the data uh, standards, um, uh, actually uh, international standards at least, European standards uh, are, are needed. So we, we need to actually do it by law. You need to, to enforce it because of uh, because all the, the developers, the different companies that uh, develop the software system for the GPs, for the hospitals, for the pharmacies, whatever, of course they want their uh, uh, little island, uh, data island for them and their use perhaps, but they don't want to uh, interact actually or interlink it with others. And that, but that is what is needed for a, a, a digital uh, uh, patient's record, for example, or for data uh, purposes. And so, and that is what we already have started, we are forcing them to open up um, and to uh, use the same standard, uh, data standard base. Of course, we need to regulate which data can be used by whom for what, um, uh, and that the citizen is always in the driver's seat to say yes or no to whatever, uh, to whatever use. Um, and that is actually what we are uh, developing already by having made laws and, and by further developing new laws and regulatory frameworks. Uh, and, that is, and that is the European health data space, what we are continuing to do uh, on, a, on a European level uh, too. Just, I mean, you, need, you know this anecdote by me, but I'm still astonished, actually, 
uh, by how many Germans and European citizens are easily willing to give health data to yeah. Apple, Google, just writing a WhatsApp message to your family, I think I have the flu today, is in health information you more or less give uh, uh, to Facebook, uh, which owns uh, WhatsApp. Uh, uh, and so actually, as soon as we set up a standard here in Germany on German servers with German data protection and data security uh, uh, rules, uh, um, there's always a debate, which is understandable, but I would wish for more debate regarding uh, the private use of health data as well. Yeah. You mentioned a very interesting metaphor. You used to call it an island. There are thousands of islands of IT solutions, and I think it is uh, also in the German presidency of the European Union is it a good task to try to make a continent out of all these islands and bring them together with interoperability. Thank you for this answer. And the second uh, person online now for posing the question is Annabelle Seebohm from the Standing Committee of European Doctors, our General Secretary. Annabelle, please do put your question. Yes, good morning, Minister Spahn. What will the German presidency leave as legacy in the digital health file? And what would you like to see that the uh, Portuguese presidency continues to work on? Well, uh, what we see as a legacy in, in the digital health area uh, actually started by Germany. I have to admit we can't finish it till the end of the year. That's too big a project. Is it, it's really six weeks left. So. Yes. yes. Uh, at the European uh, health data space, this code of conduct, this legal framework really needs to be developed. And we, we, we went deep into it already. Uh, with many, many working groups, with the Commission, with member states, with stakeholders uh, in Europe. And uh, the, the, the work has started and is still ongoing, but it can't be finished uh, within these six months. But actually, we are very happy to have started it, uh, at least. What we plan, by the way, is uh, to finish the EU for Health uh, um, uh, uh, negotiation, the trilogue between Commission, Parliament and Council till the end of the year, and that is more than 5 billion euros. Uh, by the European budget for health care in Europe. And of course, we want to foster digital in, in, innovation with that too. Uh, last point, you mentioned um, uh, the Portuguese presidency following to others. Uh, we, I'm in very close contact with my uh, Portuguese colleague, with Marta. Um, uh, and actually, what I really found surprising, that's something I learned a week ago or two on a digital conference we made, that um, the Estonian president mentioned that Estonia, which is kind of leading in all of this, um, that an Estonian patient and a Finnish patient uh, actually have the same access on bo in both countries, for example, when it comes that it is connected uh, to e-prescription. And then she said, and we have the same with Portugal. And I asked why Portugal? I mean, Estonia and Portugal is kind of far away. <laughs> Finland is, is very obvious. And she said, because they wanted to. And that is actually what I want to leave as a kind of legacy that be the idea of a Europe, a Europe of pioneers, that we don't wait always till the last one, till all 27 are at the same point. That's important every now and then, and in the end we need to be there all together, um, but we need pioneers that start, always inclusive, never saying it's only us, five, four, ten member states and no one can join, always saying who wants can join and being part of the project can join, uh, but we start. And that is actually what Estonia, Finland, and Portugal did, obviously, in this regard. Uh, and that is uh, something we, we do advocate for to see more often. We started, by the way, with Portugal uh, and Slovenia, the TRIO presidency, uh, uh, child uh, cancer research uh, network uh, to exchange data. It started in Germany, and then we invited Slovenia and, and, and Portugal uh, as a starting point for pioneers in Europe. And now we will try to get more countries in. And I just wish. Uh, for all of us, all member states, and by all member states, that we keep this idea of a Europe of pioneers really starting things and not waiting for the last one uh, as a kind of uh, motto for the 20s. So not the slowest ship in the convoy uh, demands the, temp the speed, uh, but even a faster vision. Now, thank you very much uh, for your participation. It was uh, quite a challenge and quite interesting for me. We have had many discussions uh, in the past, uh, controversial and friendly. Uh, this was the first one in English, so yeah, it sure. was uh, quite surprising to see my minister uh, in English and meet him and discuss with him. Thank you very much for having been here. I and wish you a good conference. All the best. Thank you very much. We're a little bit uh, short of time, running short of time already.
So to set the scene, we now have uh, already uh, introduced by uh, my friend Klaus Reinhardt, um, we deal are now having uh, Michel Servos uh, as uh, the next speaker here in the panel. Michel Servos is a senior legal counsel at the law firm Gide Loiret Noël, and he is a present resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund in Washington, DC. Until recently, he was advisor to the president of the European Commission on Artificial Intelligence and Digital Transformation of Economy. He worked before as a negotiator in European bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations. And before joining the European Commission, Michel worked as a law professor and as a judge. We are very pleased now to hear his assessment of the challenges when using AI and robotization in healthcare and his recommendations for this transition to be positive. Michel Servo, the table, the floor is yours. So thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Montgomery. I'm pleased to uh, join you from Washington. We have a lot of sunshine this morning, so it's a, a very uh, pleasant day. And uh, I'd like to set the scene here by showing sh uh, you a few pictures, uh, which are designed to put things in perspective. And so this first uh, picture is really about uh, how our economy and our jobs are changing over the um, over history. And so this is one of the examples of a major disruption caused by technology, uh, which created a lot of changes in our societies. So you see the, the picture uh, taken in 1905. This is the Easter parade on Fifth Avenue. Basically, uh, you can see only horse carriages and only one car, if you are able to spot the car. And then, eight years later, 1913, the same Easter parade on Fifth Avenue in New York. Actually, you can only see cars and no longer any horse carriages. So it's amazing to see the, the, the pace of change uh, over this period. And I can tell you, because uh, we've made some research about that, at the time, there were demonstrations, uh, protestations against the use of cars. Uh, because people were saying it's going to destroy jobs, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, it completely changed the economy by opening new sectors of the, uh, of the economy um, in logistics. For example, the tourism industry um, actually uh, grew after the uh, arrival of cars. Now to the second slide, which is also um, a major change um, in our economic history. Um, so if you could put the second slide on, it will show you uh, the picture of uh, a movie uh, from Hollywood, which is called Hidden Figures. And uh, this movie um, is actually a movie about um, race. It's a movie about um, diversity. It's a movie about gender, but in fact, it's also a, a very interesting reminder that computer, before it was this machine on your desk, was actually a job. These uh, three women, they were actually computers, uh, which means that their job um, was to make calculations to send uh, rockets in space. And actually, they did all the calculations necessary to send men on the moon. It's hard to believe now. And what is really interesting is that um, in the middle of the movie, uh, NASA is buying a big IBM computer mainframe. You know, these kind of computers that at the time were basically taking the whole floor of the building to produce a result far less interesting than your smartphone. And so the lady on the, on the right um, understands immediately that actually her job is going to change. And what she does is basically she learns programming language. Fortran was the programming language at the time, and she becomes a computer engineer. So it's a reminder, it's a very interesting reminder that basically technology is happening all the time and changing our, our lives. Now to the next um, slide, I would like to show these uh, two pictures. The, the one on the left is actually the assembly line of Hyundai in South Korea. And the one on the right is um, some stores which are operated by Amazon in California. 
where you have actually nobody um, in the store except the customers. And so you could uh, say, basically, this means it's destroying jobs. And what it means is artificial intelligence and robotization, in both cases, they have not destroyed jobs, or they have destroyed jobs which were low-skilled, which were boring jobs, low-paying jobs. And in fact, these jobs have been replaced by high-quality jobs, about um, which involve a lot of creativity, which are about design, which are about maintenance, which are about quality control. So it does not mean the end of jobs, it means a big transformation. And now moving on to the next slide, I think it's also very important uh, to remember that artificial intelligence or robots, they have very strong limitation. It's very clear that artificial intelligence is a bit of a misnomer because it does not mean human intelligence. In fact, there are a number of tasks, a number of jobs which can only be performed by humans. But in all these activities, actually what is important to remember is the fact that um, artificial intelligence or robots, they are tools that power uh, humans uh, to have more skills or to increase their capacity. And uh, this is why I would say that um, artificial intelligence in particular, uh, but robotization is the same because uh, the two are very closely connected. These are very important tools for the health sector. Uh, for me, it means that actually um, they can take care, artificial intelligence and robots can take care a lot of the routine tasks in order to free the doctors for patient care and in order also to give them more information, more precise information for decision making. So um, I have a few examples in mind. Um, it's clear that AI will be extremely useful in order to monitor patients on a day-to-day -day basis um, and detect anomalies. Um, likewise, uh, to predict, to make reliable predictions about uh, risks uh, for patients to develop certain conditions. And I, I would say also the fact that um, artificial intelligence is used to collect, to analyze data, and on the basis of this analysis, uh, to come uh, to uh, conclusions, recommendations that can be used by uh, doctors in their decisions, that's also um, a huge uh, improvement. And finally, and I think it's really important in the present situation, um, we can see now the impact, the positive impact that artificial intelligence and uh, robotization had on the development of treatment for COVID, on the development of vaccines. Um, that I think is really um, important. But in all of this, what I want to stress is that artificial intelligence is not here to replace doctors. It's a tool and it's very clear that at the same time, it has limitations. For example, creativity, uh, reacting to unpredictable situations, uh, problem solving, critical thinking. This is not something that artificial intelligence can do. And this is something that is reserved for, uh, reserved for humans. So at the end of the day, what is really crucial is for doctors to understand uh, the limitations of AI, to understand how best uh, they can use artificial intelligence, because I think for the health profession, it's going to be um, a huge improvement in the skills, in the capacity, and in the performance of the medical profession. I'd like maybe to stop here and engage in a discussion with Professor Montgomery. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Servos, uh, for this uh, very, very inspiring introduction. You've already mentioned uh, a lot of things that I would like to ask you. One of the first is actually, you mentioned uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we in CPME are not very happy about this wording. We call it augmented uh, intelligence because there is nothing really artificial about this type of intelligence. Uh, do you have a position on that? I fully agree. I think it's uh, the, the word um, augmented is very appropriate because what artificial intelligence does is actually augment, increase the capacity of humans. 
it does not replace the humans. And so I think it's really important also for doctors, for the medical profession, um, to learn how to interact with artificial intelligence. For example, not to believe that AI makes the decision. AI is just a tool. The decisions remain with the humans. And I think this borderline is really important. Also, uh, let me be clear, in some cases, artificial intelligence is making mistake. And uh, so it's really important that doctors have a critical eye on the recommendations, on the findings that they get from artificial intelligence. Yes. Well, we learned that artificial or augmented intelligence is only as good as the people behind it because someone has to write the algorithms on which uh, all this works on. So do you have a position on the question of whether we have ethical boundaries for these uh, people that write uh, the algorithms? And do you have an idea, of maybe from the European Commission or from the European Union, who could certify this sort of algorithm? Because I see a program of augmented intelligence for a physician should be just as usable as a drug. You don't understand mm. exactly everything, but you know how it works and you know what the outcome yeah. is and you can rest assured that that is good. Can you give us any idea of uh, what we can do? Because I think it's very difficult to find ethical guidelines for the algorithms. Yeah, and I think this is exactly where uh, we should be clear that the algorithm is actually a technical device which is developed by a computer engineer. But this computer engineer needs to work under the direction, under the control, and under the responsibility of a medical doctor. Because only he or she, the doctor, knows how the product can be used, what is uh, its limitations, and also how to correct some uh, inherent biases. Um, it's really uh, very striking um, to see that the development of some AI, artificial intelligence applications, has led uh, to discrimination, to mistakes, simply because they, they were reflecting uh, human biases or human errors. And so, for me, it's the development of the algorithm is a technical task. What is really important is for the doctor to understand how this technical device has been developed, which means, by the way, that doctors in general need to have a pretty good understanding of the technicalities of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so it's a question of literacy, of understanding, because the task of the doctor will be not only to control what the algorithm is doing, but also then to be able to explain to the patient how the artificial intelligence has worked and what are the conclusions and to assume the responsibility uh, for the diagnostic or for the medical conclusions uh, for the decision making in medical conditions. Yeah, that was very interesting, but it brings me to two further questions. One, I mean, knowing that you have had high positions in the European Commission, uh, the question is who could be the authority which would certify algorithms and would make sure, because you can't ask the doctor out in the street to uh, yep. understand exactly the, the creation of an algorithm. So we have to have a certified algorithm like, uh, like the EMA does for drugs. And my first question is, who could be the authority that could authorize this? But the second question is, we talked about literacy, doctors, uh, health literacy, and it's not only doctors, it's nurses and other professions as well. Uh, how do we set up programs and who is going to set up the training programs and at what stage? Do we do it at kindergarten or at school, at university, or where should we come in mm. with uh, such fast-moving technologies, with such fast-changing uh, uh, changing intelligence. Uh, so, first question, who is the authority to certify? Second question, literacy programs, who is responsible for that, in your opinion? Well, um, on the first question, the, the Commission has worked with a group of experts um, to uh, prepare some um, guidelines for the use, of, for a sustainable use of artificial intelligence. And these guidelines, 
are now in operation since uh, a few months. Uh, they were issued, uh, they were released in the spring. And for me, it's a very interesting first step because um, to be frank, actually, there are some developments on artificial intelligence, which we are not uh, completely familiar with yet. We need to understand how it works in practice before coming hard and fast uh, with rules. And so the idea, which I think is a very good one, was actually to start first by some guidelines and to see how companies, our professions, um, how unions uh, would use them to see if there were some incidents, some problems. And, uh, and then you may know that the Commission has promised then to make a proposal, a legislative proposal on the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, a white paper has been uh, produced a few months ago, and in this white paper, the Commission makes a distinction between high-risk um, applications and low-risk um, applications. For the high-risk applications, nothing has been decided yet. Uh, there is a, an ongoing consultation. But for the high-risk applications, basically the idea is to have an ex-ante certification of the algorithm, but also of the way the data sets are being used and of the machine learning process. And um, of course, this ex-ante certification will have to follow some standards, which will be determined by the legislation, and then it will be applied in all member states, uh, probably um, in a process uh, which is very similar to the way we audit company for financial matters. That's basically the idea, and uh, we expect this legislation to be ready at the beginning of, uh, of next year. Um, I should also say that um, on the way the guidelines are implemented, uh, generally companies are very receptive uh, to these guidelines, and so I think it's moving in the, in the right direction. I think there is a very strong awareness in Europe of the need to use artificial intelligence in a way which is human, which is sustainable. Um, I would say this concern is far less established in the United States, for example. And then to yeah. your second question, um, I would say education is everything um, for artificial intelligence, because I didn't say it, but it's very clear that what, was, what is going on now is actually a process where we will not see massive unemployment but we will see a massive transition in jobs, a big change in jobs. And for that to happen in a smooth way, you need more education. So it's clear that because of AI, some low-skilled jobs are going to disappear. Just like this, uh, the store, I, the Amazon store I was showing. And, and so you need education. And for me, it is basically three elements which are absolutely crucial. One is digital skills. It's crucial for the whole population. It is essential for doctors to have good digital skills, which allow them to, as I said earlier, to assume the responsibility uh, for decisions which are powered by artificial intelligence. The other element I would point out is soft skills. It's really important, if you want to work with machines, that uh, doctors and uh, workers in general have better uh, human skills. For example, creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, all these elements. And these are things for me that need to be developed through the medical, the professional associations. Because it's very clear that for students today, we can probably change the curriculum of education. But for the doctors who are in their career since 10 years, I think the only solution is to provide this training uh, through um, the professional associations, the medical associations. Yes, thank you very much, because that really hits, uh, hits the issue. I mean, we as medical professions have already set up training programs, both in postgraduate training and in students' training at university. But um, this is the responsibility of the profession itself. But if, as president of the CPMA, I may just say uh, the ethical guidelines and the white paper have been produced with a little low participation of doctors. We would have loved to take part in that and help you with it because I think you have to keep the people from the front uh, 
uh, in, uh, in this discussion as well. But uh, the, I had to say that, I'm sorry, but uh, it, it just happened. <laughs> Just as a as a final a final question, um, you know there is uh, this report, the future of work, work of the future, uh, and uh, the subtitle is "Don't panic." Um, just a brief question. I know you will t probably tell us "Don't panic," but uh, can you understand that many people do feel a little bit uh, in a panicky situation because they don't know how to cope? And what advice can you give us to prevent panic? Yes, the subtitle, I, by the way, I should give the credit to my son uh, because he, he said to me that uh, when he had a look at the report and he said to me that uh, the, this subtitle is actually coming from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And um, it's a very interesting book if you have the time to, uh, to read it. Um, and basically the message is uh, be, be ready for some surprises and it's going to be fun. And uh, for me, that's what I said at the beginning. This kind of huge disruption from technology, we get them all the time. And yes, AI is going to disrupt um, our jobs, is going to change our jobs a lot. But we've done that in the past and it has improved the quality of, jo of our jobs. Let me just give you uh, uh, an example. When I started my career, that was a long time ago, um, the first a uh, tool we received in the office was an electric typewriter. And we thought, what an improvement on our office life. With and now look at today. Band, with a correction tape inside, so you yes, could correct yes, exactly. it. Yes. I wrote my thesis on and, that. <laughs> yes, and today we do everything on our computers. We have mobile phones. I take my appointment myself. I participate in this conference uh, through my computer. So we have managed that. It was not a problem. And so I think we should be confident. And by the way, if I can add something. For me, the present situation, the COVID crisis is a very good example that the medical profession is actually extremely resilient. Because when you see the severity of the crisis, the huge problems that face uh, that the medical profession is facing, I think we can say that uh, the doctors and all the health sector has really shown uh, its capacity uh, to rise up to the challenge. Uh, so for me, the COVID crisis is much worse as a challenge than the disruption caused by AI. So I'm very confident that the health profession in particular um, will have uh, all the tools necessary um, to be very performing in the future. And I, I think let's all remember that in Europe, we have excellent universities, we have labs, we have excellent R&D centers, we have public funds, we have investment capacity. So I think we have the possibility to adapt uh, to AI and to be actually very competitive with it. Well, thank you very much uh, for this inspiring uh, dialogue which we had. And I can only, uh, only say you're perfectly right. I think the COVID crisis in Europe gives a tremendous push to digitalization at, at the same time, and both in patients and in physicians and hospitals. So this will bring us uh, forward, though it's a sad, uh, sad uh, background and a sad reason why. But thank you very much for your inspiring words sure. and have a good time in sunny Washington. And um, yes. I hope, uh, I hope um, that um, all the electoral problems around you uh, do, do not impede your visit to the US. Thank you very much, Michelle, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank goodbye. you. Goodbye. So our speakers up to now and so far have given us a professional and political context uh, of our debate. But now we would like to zoom in more closely uh, to key stakeholders and learn more about their views uh, and activities contributing to digital skills for doctors. Therefore, we've set up uh, in a hybrid format uh, a panel discussion with several participants. And I will just briefly introduce them to you uh, before we hear their statements uh, and their reactions to questions. The first uh, who we welcome is Lina Mosch. She is uh, the former Health Policy Director at the European Medical Students Association, EMSA. 
uh, the please come uh, up here and join me at uh, the rostrum. The next is um, Professor is uh, Dr. Vilja Pietieinen from the University of Helsinki's Institute of Molecular Medicine in Finland. Welcome. You're uh, on uh, online. You're not here presently, but you're online uh, discussing with us. Professor Sebastian Kuhn, a professor of digital medicine at the medical faculty Ostwestfalen Lippe at Bielefeld, has joined me at the podium. Linda Keane is the general manager of ICDL Ireland and uh, the lead on e-skills for health professionals in the EU Health Joint Action. Professor Jörg Debatin is chairman of the Health Innovation Hub at the German Federal Ministry of Health. Welcome, Jörg. And Marco Marcella is head of the unit eHealth Wellbeing and Aging at the European Commission's Director General for Communications, Content and Technology, better known by all of us as DigiConnect. Uh, so, <laughs> Marco, welcome. In the first round, um, to launch our debate, I would like uh, to start with uh, our future, uh, with uh, our future generation, that is. And I would like to invite Lina Mosch, who is in her final year as medical student at Charité University here in Berlin. She coordinated EMSAS, the European Medical Students Association's work on digital health over the years 2018 to 2019. Uh, and uh, in particular, she uh, installed a European-wide assessment of medical students' attitudes and knowledge about digital health with a special focus on implementation of these issues into medical education. And uh, as a medical student, um, uh, I, did you feel well prepared? Or can you tell us now that medical students nowadays after your work uh, feel better prepared? Can you give us any examples of good practice uh, from European member states? Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so the short answer uh, would be no. We do not feel well prepared. But uh, we did indeed assess the opinions of medical students uh, in Europe a bit um, more in depth. Um, and what we found is that also all medical students in Europe, or at least the 450 people that we um, um, asked and, and that responded to our survey, uh, they did not feel well prepared to work in a digitalized healthcare system. And, um, they also evaluated their e-health skills as poor or very poor, the majority of more than 50% said so. While, on the other hand, we found that 85% um, of students actually are willing and wish e-health to be more implemented in the curriculum. Um, so we concluded and we still see um, actually a huge gap in our current ed education from on the one side the, the willingness of students to become um, part of the digitalization of healthcare and to learn about e-health and the other on the other hand we have the lack uh, of education and practical training um, but um, yeah as you as you asked for best practice examples there is uh, hope so to say and I think especially at the moment a lot of things are happening um, we have nationwide frameworks in, in Portugal um, as we heard before um, there's the national telehealth program with a special focus on education of health professionals we have the topo report from the UK the NHS um, which um, was released in 2019 and now we have the one year on update showing the progress in the in the UK um, and we have Finland and I am sure that we will hear more about that um, just in a few few instances um, so we have that, we have the um, medical informatics institutes that are emerging all across uh, Europe, especially in Germany. Um, and I think that is a very important point because um, medical informatics at your own faculty is really the competence you need at a local level. If you have a medical faculty, I think in the current um, era you need to have a medical informatics institute in order to build the capacity and also to expand the network of digital health experts um, all across Europe. And I'm very happy that also Professor Kuhn is with us today. He's um, one professor of, uh, for digital health. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I, it's I, my I, job no, to introduce <laughs> him. So. I know, I know. Just, uh, just as a best practice <laughs> example, I think that is also very, um, we should mention that as well. And we have the learning objective catalogs that have been developed by uh, the German Medical Informatic in Initiative and also the FME, the European Federation for medical informatics is doing um, or is, is engaged in that topic and um, 
I know that a lot of universities are revising their curricula now uh, with those learning objectives. And I think that's, that's an important step. And of course, yeah, what we have implemented today is, is still not enough. Um, we have a lot of electives um, in, in Budapest, in Berlin. A lot of European universities have that. But um, with the learning competencies catalog and the, the outcomes, I think uh, that is really a good tool to, um, to revise learning objective catalogs at universities. Mm -hmm. And um, a last point for best practice, I would like to emphasize the students' engagement, the bottom-up approach, because um, what I just listed were all the, the top-down approach, the policy approaches, and so on. But um, I, think I hear often that... Um, Students are not willing to, to get engaged with digital health. And I really want to emphasize here that this, um, if I, from my perspective, this is not true. And I know a lot of um, students that uh, get engaged with that. We have the EMSA toolkit on digital health, which we released this year. We will have an EMSA series um, of, of webinars on digital health. And we also have national projects. For example, the German Medical Students Association has now launched a nationwide project for digital health. So we have a lot of best practice examples, but I think the challenge will be to align them and really connect the dots in order to uh, yeah, make the best out of it and provide the best um, digital health education to our future physicians. I think that is very important <laughs> because myself being born as a digital apprentice and having started, as we heard earlier with Michelle, with an uh, electric typewriter with a correction tape, um, uh, I feel, and I've lectured up to a few uh, years ago, I feel that the, the driving force comes out of the digital native uh, um, generation. So we're very helpful. This is why we wanted you to start uh, uh, this discussion now. But coming from the student's point of view, we would now like to move to the educator's point of view. And uh, I would like to introduce to you from Finland, Dr. Vilja Pietienen. Vilja Pietienen is a senior scientist and team leader at the Institute for Molecular Medicine in Finland. She has a PhD in virology, cell biology since 2005. She, she asked a lot on other issues just now at the, the present time. Her research focuses on the functional precision cancer medicine of uh, solid tumors. But she's also a coordinator of, um, of undergraduate education strategy. She's uh, very active in the development of training for trans translational biomedicine and as a course organizer. So, uh, uh, Lin Vilja, if I can ask you, you developed curricula for medical students in relation to digital, digital competencies. Could you explain the model at uh, Helsinki University to us? Please, you have the floor. Okay. Yes, thank you. I hope that the connection is, is, is working and I'm very, very glad to be here today. So, um, I, first of all, I foresee myself not as a, as a, as a kind of doctor, but as a, as a, a biochemist and a translational biologist, as a kind of uh, person who can facilitate and bring um, the knowledge together um, from different fields uh, to the medical students to understand better the digital health and, and the development. And, in, in, the, in the technology side and, and, and for that aim at the University of, of, of Helsinki but also actually in, in whole Finland there's a so-called um, new type of the MedDG Med project uh, which now in, um, has been already ongoing for two, two years and will still go uh, for two more years and there uh, the aim is to harmonize uh, the digital training and teaching and also to make the students to better understand the e-health uh, procedures and for example the e-health records we have in Finland and and um, and actually we have planned some courses which are already respond responding to to this um, kind of program and there um, we as I said uh, we want to kind of bring in those people who are actually the specialists in the field uh, the medical doctors who've been already using, for example, artificial intelligence in the research projects, uh, but in the clinic side. And then on the other hand, those, for example, developing the, uh, the, the digital pathology, uh, for example, in the company side. And also those who provide the new type of the tools for the, for the customers or for the society, for people, for example, uh, also to the patients, such as like breast cancer patients staying at a home after the treatments and how they can actually by mobile services, um, connect back to the clinics and, and also 
also um, screen how, how well they are doing. So these type of things we, we bring to the students. And we also, as, as I, I kind of want to point out the very important point by the, by the previous speaker, that we really want students to be involved. And we also have the courses where students are actually organizing, uh, for example, the innovation course where they um, look the new healthcare innovations together with the companies and actually build up the models with them. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, I think what is important is that you also mentioned uh, um, the interaction with patients, uh, uh, with their systems, uh, but also, of course, with industry, because industry is providing a lot of the technology behind. Uh, actually, I'm very envious of you, because sitting here in grey Berlin, I can see in the background of your window that the sun is shining in Finland. And from other friends, I've heard that you've even had snow, the first snow this night. So uh, you are very lucky, you are very, uh, and we are very grateful for your contribution. I'll come back to you later. Uh, but now I would like um, to intro introduce um, Sebastian Kuhn, Professor Sebastian Kuhn, who is with us here in uh, Berlin. He is a professor for digital medicine at the medical faculty in Bielefeld. But actually, his, his prime job is he's a, um, he is a senior physician for orthopedics and trauma surgery. Uh, and he is conducting a lot of research on digital in transformation in healthcare. Among other activities, he was head of the educational reform project Medicine in the Digital Age. And uh, we are very grateful because he also represented the CPME, the European Doctors, in its involvement with the European Commission's high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. Uh, Professor Kuhn, for your former University of Mainz, you developed curricula in relation to digital competencies. Could you explain the Mainz model so that we understand it a little bit better? You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, medicine has always been a field where technology innovation was translated into new diagnostic and treatment options. And this is always very much tied with the qualification, the creation of new jobs, new professions, and a new curricula. You're a radiologist. A hundred years ago, the technology improvement of um, X-ray was found its way into new diagnostics as X-ray or CT, and also into, um, into new treatment options as in radiation therapy. And new jobs existed, like your profession to become a radiologist, and became a core requirement for all medical students to learn about these techniques, and new jobs were created. Well, for us, digital medicine are the X-rays of our time. So I'm not only involved in technology involvement, innovation, and new processes, but at the very heart, it is about new curriculum, new competency for doctors. So in the MINDS model, we try to create uh, a new educational approach for medical students so they can understand that it's really part of their profession, that it's about being a doctor, uh, to introduce it into, into their clinical practice. But also, we use the same model for continuous medical education. And um, the thing is, digital transformation is often misunderstood as like a, a prime or core technology innovation. And to some form, it is. But it is more about using that technology and including it into your daily practice as a, as a doctor, as a tool. And it becomes not, technology is not replacing the doctor but it's augmenting the doctor's abilities, like lab results or imaging has augmented our, our possibilities in the past. So um, what we try to do, we not only um, try to bring new knowledge um, to the students, but really to do hands-on experience. And we put them into simulation uh, areas where they, um, where they can use those technologies in new field. And it's a lot about critical reflection, about ethics, about thinking what the patient really needs, about, um, about really becoming a change maker. So uh, a big part of the curriculum is also critical reflection and, uh, and discussion among various groups. So we involve not only different medical professions and healthcare professionals. No, at the very core, we include patients as teachers. We include um, data protectionists. We include uh, apps and uh, startups as part of the curriculum. So I think it's about new topics, new curricula, new competencies, not only knowledge, but also skills and critical reflection and the ability to really transform your own job. 
and about new cooperation with new people in a very interdisciplinary, interprofessional fashion. And that's what digital medicine is all about. And we want to simulate that in our curricula at the medical program, but also at the residency level and at CME level. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, very interesting. If, if you allow me, you mentioned I'm a radiologist, and I think there is a similarity in the kickoff of these different professions. You know what the radiologists of the beginning, 100 years ago, were? Yep. They were the surgeons who had two left hands and could, wouldn't, they would, wouldn't want to be seen in the operating theater. That's why they were sent into the basement lab to start technique with these new machines. Nowadays, radiology has become an entity of its own and very much relies on uh, augmented intelligence and has become an extremely interesting topic. So if ever one of you looks for a job, radiology is always a real, real, real chance and uh, opportunity. Now, um, we've heard about um, the, difference, the, the difficulties of having a lifelong chain of, um, of uh, education in digital skills. And I would like to ask Dr. Pietienen, are there any links in the Finnish model between undergraduate and specialist educations to maintain digital skills? Because uh, once we leave university, then we may even leave hospital and go into private practice in several countries. It is far more distance to hospitals as it is in your home country. How do we keep up the digital skills uh, over a lifelong learning experience? You're muted. Please unmute yourself. Yes. OK. OK, sorry. So um, actually, we, we have um, got in Finland uh, the professional special competence uh, type of uh, uh, training for, for health information technology uh, for e-health since 2012 for physicians and, and since 2015 to, to dentists as well. Uh, so, so that they can actually, who are already in the profession, learn the e-health skills, which are very important, uh, of course, for example, e-health records. Uh, at the moment, this uh, program I actually mentioned, this uh, Medici project, is aiming more towards undergraduate students as well as training of the teachers, which is actually a very, very important thing, as, as the teachers may not have actually sometimes as good digital skills to start with than, than students who are kind of uh, grown to, to the world of, of, of digital uh, technologies. So in, in this sense, um, uh, the first aim is to set this this um, kind of uh, harmonized Finnish system for the and, and the pipeline platform for the for the undergraduate students. But then, when the tools are there, they will be available also to those ones who are already already working um, working as as clinicians. And this is actually extremely important. But but currently, the focus is 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 more in the training side uh, still. To, to my knowledge, uh, in, in the student, student side and, and setting up the harmonized uh, national um, uh, training in, in digital health. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a similar program in your concept, uh, Sebastian, in Mainz? Um, yes, it is. And I think uh, we started in Mainz now four years ago and to, to pilot it. And it was the first curriculum in a German speaking German speaking area. But we try to advance it into different areas. And Lina and I and, and colleagues from Charité, we worked together, we worked with the Hamburg group together. And we moved it also to the, to the national level to really think about uh, we need, uh, we have a, uh, a unique challenge and a, and a combined challenge among us. So we try to uh, put it into a framework and put it into, uh, into goals and to concepts and to really interconnect that. And we did this as kind of like as a basic um, qualification level. But at the moment, I think the next step is to really dive deep into different areas. And I think we've been quite good to to um, to introduce like a base core requirement. And now we're going into more specialized fields like the AI in medicine area or a program which focuses really very much on app prescription, what uh, Minister Schwan just mentioned, because um, the one side is the technology, and that has to be good and has to be quality controlled. But to put it into purposeful medical practice every day, in every office, in every hospital, is a different challenge. And that is very much um, connected to kind of a national or European strategy to really introduce it in a broad context. So I think I do see quite a lot of parallels there. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, 
we could discuss this for hours now, and I think it would be very interesting, but we have to move on a little bit. And we've seen the undergraduate position, we've seen the postgraduate position, we've talked about CME. I would now like to talk about the political dimension uh, of all this. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Jörg Debatin to you. Professor Jörg uh, Debatin uh, is uh, he's leading the Health Innovation Hub in Berlin. Uh, but he and I, we have a very long uh, common history because he was also not only a very leading radiologist in Germany, but he was also the CEO of the hospital I worked in. And uh, in his friendly manner, he always used to tell me that I'm on his payroll. Uh, nowadays, this has changed, Jörg. We are good friends, so I, I, I can address him like that. I saw your forehead crinkle a little bit when I mentioned the stories about the surgeons being the founders of radiologists, radiology, I mean the surgeons with two left hands. But we would now like to hear from you what um, the government does, uh, what your organization does uh, to support uh, digital skills for doctors. Jörg. Well, good morning, first of all, and uh, thanks very much for having me, and um, particularly uh, uh, I want to aid you for a while, but because uh, it really turns out, um, you know, we, we would be missing, lacking something if you didn't moderate the session. Now, um, yes, indeed, I was a little, um, you know, wondering uh, about your comment about the surgeon with two left hands. You are, of course, correct with that. Um, unfortunately, I still have two left hands, so I wouldn't be useful on the operating theater. Um, but, um, you know, fortunately, medicine has evolved, and that's really the topic, um, you really, I think, of today's uh, session. It's, a, it's an evolution, and now we're embracing a new technology that admittedly is uh, really changing the foundation of a lot of things that we actually do. But let's not forget, we have done very, very well in the medical profession to embrace new technologies in the past. So I, I, I think we will actually uh, uh, live up to this to this challenge, similar to what uh, uh, Selmo said. Uh, you know, we are we are actually handling the um, the Corona pandemic uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a in a massive way. Um, we are really uh, rising up to the occasion, and I'm sure uh, the, the same thing will happen with uh, regard to digital medicine. Now, if we uh, sort of uh, want to embrace this, we have to actually um, sort of implement it. And um, so the first thing that um, needs to be done is to find um, a way to get these technologies uh, in a legally manageable and a safe way um, to be part of patient care. And um, so this is where the government is actually um, um, sort of uh, important because they do provide the regulatory basis um, for implementing uh, many of these data management systems. And that's really um, what we uh, are focusing on, uh, what the Jens Spahn and his team has focused on over the last two years, where we have made some progress. And our job in the Health Innovation Hub uh, is um, um, to make sure that um, these regulatory uh, sort of rules really um, sort of um, help us in, 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 in moving uh, digital technologies into um, real patient care. Um, with regard to um, you know what, what what other things so 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 we have to make it part of everybody's uh, experience. I think that will make it a lot easier for medical students to be exposed to this, and thereby um, it, it will generate their interest, and then we can teach about sort of um, um, the possibilities of technology, but also its limitations. And that's a, a very important uh, point that uh, I like to uh, again emphasize that. Michel Sarabou really uh, pointed out, yes, um, uh, there are limitations and we as users of technology um, uh, in the interest of better patient care, uh, and that's really always what we need to strive for as, 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 as applicators of these technologies in the interest of patients, we need to understand the possibilities, um, but also the limitations. And this is where um, a much of the curricular um, efforts, I think, should be focused on. In addition to that, then, um, as we move down the chain um, to the developers of these technologies, I'm really glad that uh, Sebastian and, and others are focusing on the cultural aspects also of medicine and uh, bringing in patients and making these developers understand the needs of patients, but also, quite frankly, the needs of nurses, the needs, uh, needs of physicians, uh, to make these tools fit into our lives 
and so that we don't have to adjust our lives or adjust the needs of patients to fit the technology, but rather it needs to go the other way around. Um, um, IT follows process, follows uh, the requirements of patients and uh, healthcare professionals. But um, you know, just getting back to your question, really what we do is we make sure that there is a regulatory framework that um, does cater to these needs and that does allow these uh, technologies to be introduced in a safe and, uh, and, and in a legally uh, binding fashion. Oh, thank you, Jörg. Now, now if, I, if I can just follow on, in my presentation of your personality, uh, I deliberately uh, left out to uh, one stage, uh, and that was you were also um, CEO, uh, Vice President, Chief Technology and Medical Officer for GE Healthcare. And you were the CEO of a large laboratory company in Germany, so you have a lot of in industry experience as well. Now, my question would also be, do you see from your point of view now, the digital hub uh, in Berlin, is there sufficient cooperation between politics, uh, profession and the industry in Europe? And I'm talking of Europe deliberately and not of the US or other uh, areas of the world. Do you see there is uh, enough cooperation or can we do anything to improve it? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think that's a very interesting question, Monty. Um, and the, the reason um, I, I find it fascinating is because we understand that our profession is undergoing change because of these technologies. But believe me, industry is undergoing a, a, an even more dramatic change uh, in, in, in two respects. They don't just have to embrace new technologies, hire new engineers with new training sets, et cetera, et cetera, and training skills, um, but they also have to focus a lot more on the market needs. They have to understand the world of patients and they have to understand the world of healthcare professionals. And if there's one thing that um, um, I, I think is really important and I would like to uh, everyone to, to participate is to strengthen that alliance between healthcare providers and industry uh, and try to sort of interact as much as, as, as possible. They, their products will only be as good as their understanding of our world. Um, and um, so uh, we need to go out and explain that work world to our partners um, uh, within a, um, a national setting, within an international setting. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, to make it easy for them, it really helps if we do provide them with formats that allow interoperability, which is, of course, key in digital uh, medicine. That's why the European data space is so important. If we don't provide that framework, it will be very difficult for industry to really embrace uh, digital technologies because the markets will be too limited. They, they, they need to cater to larger markets. Uh, they want um, um, their products to be working in Finland as well as in Germany, as well as in Austria and all over Europe. Uh, so that's that's one prerequisite. But really, the other aspect is they need to better understand our world um, as we are trying to better understand the world of our patients. So it's really moving together and whoever manages to get these um, um, stakeholders um, with the patient in their in their center uh, together will, will, will really will really have a huge advantage. Um, so so that's that that's really, in my mind, the main challenge for medtech industry. Um, um, to, to really understand which is a sort of embarking on the digital revolution, not just to look at the technology, but really look at the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg, uh, for this uh, insight. We come back to you later. Uh, we'd now like to move on to the European level uh, and ask our discussant, Linda Keane. She is Strategy and Operations Manager at the Irish Computer Society and Health Informatics Society of Ireland. She promoted professionalism, standards, frameworks, and competence uh, development as part of her work on national and European projects uh, focusing on digital inclusion, technology education, and health informatics. Uh, Linda contributed to two EU joint actions to support the eHealth uh, network. In September, she was appointed general manager of ICDL Ireland. You are therefore very well placed to report to us. And my question would be, what are the most common obstacles to teaching doctors in eSkills? Please, Linda. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be joining you in your conference today, coming from the west coast of Ireland, where um, we would describe it as a soft day here, which means it's raining. So, um, as you mentioned, I um, led a task in the uh, European Joint Action Project called eHealth e Action, it, it's still ongoing. And we were looking at the role that competence frameworks um, could uh, take 
in relation to upskilling health professionals, um, upskilling them, uh, improving their, their digital skills. And as part of that, we took a, a very practical approach to, um, to our task. Uh, it wasn't a research exercise. We uh, conducted a competent self-assessment exercise with 180 health professionals, and we surveyed them on a, on a number of issues around this space. And I, I extracted the, um, the group of doctors and, and their responses and what they told us about the barriers to improving um, you, their e-skills competence in, in their job. And the top responses, um, no surprise, the, the first one would be time. Of course, we know doctors are, are, are very busy people um, and no time, they, they've been given no time or afforded no time um, to invest in um, improving their own um, digital skill levels. And the second one was lack of basic training or skills. So that was seen as a barrier for them uh, to move forward. And that's interesting because, look, doctors, they're a diverse group. There's various skill levels within that, that cohort. Um, but it is recognised that there, there is quite a significant number of, of doctors who um, are lack the, the kind of basic uh, fundamental uh, digital skills um, that they would need to use, you know, whatever systems. And, and, and sometimes there's a little bit of a misconception about that because people tell us, you know, our health professionals, they all use smartphones, so therefore they're, they're covered as regards digital skills. But that's digital lifestyle skills. We're talking about digital workplace skills, which is something completely different. And there, there is um, a little mismatch around that because health systems are, can be complicated. They're business systems to use. They're not, um, you know, they're not swipeable systems. They're, they're not based, uh, you know, uh, around social media characteristics. So I think um, so some doctors certainly feel that they need to even get to a, um, a basic level before they have the confidence to um, improve their skills um, on specific systems or, or procedures in relation to their in relation to their jobs. Um, and then the, the, the third one that came out was different development strategies from top management. So again, there's lots of really good things going on, um, you know, across Europe, nationally, in medical institutions, but Perhaps there's a there there's quite a few everything's happening in silos and there isn't there isn't enough maybe joined up thinking and you know the previous panelists all mentioned um, the links between the various stages but the links between the various stakeholders as well particularly med tech um, because you know often a new system is introduced and then you know the last three months of the implementation that's dedicated to training whoever needs to use it. So, um, you know, health professionals are, are brought in, here's the system, use it and, and, and away you go. Again, without addressing what's, what's um, underneath. And given maybe the misconceptions about current skill levels um, uh, among doctors and also the, the, the requirements of specific systems, which the, um, the IT companies don't want to share, you just use our system and, and, and that's it. Um, it does lead to a bit of a bit of confusion. Lots of good endeavours, but maybe not um, not a holistic thinking, not not joined up thinking. And then just um, taking a, a broader kind of a, a approach to the potential barriers um, around improving uh, digital skills. I think you know organisations they they maybe look at a big bang approach and they say oh you know we have 10,000 doctors and we're going to you know implement a massive scheme and we're going to upskill them all or we're going to upskill everybody in our hospital and um, where you know when you're talking about digital skills initiatives really a kind of incremental approach is 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 much better um you know you you take your easy you take your quick wins at the beginning you deal with small groups that builds a momentum of its own it it develops motivation um uh, amongst colleagues and then the broader workforce you get some good news stories out so you take it bit by bit sometimes you know people go with a big bang and then and then it it, it kind of fails so 
they would kind of be um, the, the barriers that I that I would see towards um, uh, doctors developing the, the reskills right now. Of course, the time which we need to address, but also getting to that, finding out exactly that starting point around the basic skills, getting people up to a level, and then maybe pursuing different paths to address the specialisations. And I know we'll be talking about competence frameworks in a little bit, but that's that's where that can come in. It can certainly play a part. Well, thank you. thank you. I think there is one thing we have to assess is that if we look at the age distribution of our profession, there is probably a higher proportion of digital apprentices in our profession than of digital narratives in, in comparison to other, other professions. So I, you, there is an old German proverb saying you can't teach an old dog to lie. Uh, so, uh, isn't one of the concepts also not only to think about digital skills for everyone, but also about having digital leaders that can take the others by the hand and help them through the process? Uh, is that also a concept which you, uh, which you work on? Yes, absolutely. So, like that, with the, with the incremental approach, you, people, people will emerge as, as leaders early on and you use them as champions to, um, to uh, encourage motivation in, in amongst their colleagues and it kind of spreads out in ripples like that. But as well as that, so that's a little bit like Lena said, you know, you've got your on the ground champions for that and you're building ground up support. You also need very clear leadership um, at the top level as well. And, and that came out a few different times um, in our engagements with, with doctors that they wanted to see clear leadership and, you know, not, not a kind of mix, not, not confusion. Um, you know, doctors, employees will pick up on that very quickly. So it's, it's a combination of being very clear from the top and being very obvious in your support from, from from the top, as in where where you're you're bringing this and and the encouragement for everybody to get on board, but then at a practical level, uh, starting small, doing a kind of iterative effect, so that you're cumulatively building up your success, identifying your champions early on, and letting them um, push the push the momentum uh, um, amongst their colleagues. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Linda. Looking at uh, my two. Uh, personally, uh, per, uh, the, the two uh, discussants who are here personally, I, I saw they would like uh, to, to react immediately and, uh, and contribute to the discussion. We will have a second round in a minute. But before we go into the second round uh, and discuss the, especially the issue of the future, future developments and what can we do to shape the future, uh, I, I would like, and I think this is a very good bridge also into the next uh, topic, I would like to invite Marco Marcella, the head of the eHealth Wellbeing and Aging Unit and the Directorate General for Communications uh, Networks, Content and Technology, uh, the DG Connect. Uh, from 2016 to 2018, you led the unit responsible for the Web Accessibility Directive. Safer Internet and Language Technologies. Uh, you've worked on policy development, innovation and research implementation in areas of digital content, technologies for e-learning, e-inclusion and assistive technologies. Marco, can we ask you what initiatives relevant to digital medicine will the European Commission be launching? Because you are for us the Commission representative. What will EU legislation on augmented intelligence cover? You have the floor. Well, good morning, and uh, Professor Montgomery, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I'm actually very honored and pleased to represent today the European uh, Commission. So, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, very, uh, very briefly as an introduction, uh, let me first build on a word that you mentioned before, uh, Professor Montgomery. This is not about, uh, uh, you know, pushing technologies for the sake of technology. There is only a, one way of getting a, the digital transformations up and running, and that is collaboration with everybody. So even within the European Commission, we do not work in isolation. We have a, a specific groups and, uh, and, uh, and contacts uh, with our colleagues in the DG uh, that is responsible for health and uh, for uh, consumer protection and for DG justice. So <clears throat> what I'm going to present to you today, it is actually more of a group working. So, and as you uh, as you mentioned, uh, so what is the Commission doing? What are the initiatives that we are uh, proposing in the field of digital medicine? 
uh, let me remind that, that the European Commission in the field of health uh, um, does not have specific competences. This is the member states uh, uh, driven approach. Um, so what we do have as a, as a support, uh, it is uh, the, the, the mechanisms for uh, supporting cooperation, providing policies, uh, uh, information, but also support uh, uh, the aid research, uh, research uh, and innovation. And we heard this morning, I mean, from uh, Minister Spahn, uh, Michel Servo, and our colleagues here, that this digital transformation, specifically now under this pandemic, uh, it is clearly getting a push. It's getting a push not because of, a, let's say, the fancy digital transformations words, but rather because it brings benefits. It brings benefits at the government level. Um, it brings benefits to uh, the community that is using the technology, so the medical, clinical, and research community, but it's also bringing benefits to the citizens. Maybe we can follow, we can continue a little bit with our discussion here uh, on the hybrid uh, uh, area, and I, I talk uh, with our discussants who are here in the room. And uh, first of all, I would like um, uh, to move on with the final point of the discussion, which uh, we really uh, wanted to have. And before I do that, I would just like to remind you that you can pose questions to us. There will be a round uh, of questions and answers at the end. You can put your questions under the hashtag hash CPME digital skills, and we will try uh, to collect these. We have already more questions than time, but we will try to, co to collect these and group them a little bit, and then we can ask questions. If all our other uh, discussants can't come back in into the discussions, uh, we three will do uh, the whole program from here, and I think it'll be, it'll be a great chance uh, for all of us. So what do we have to do in the future? If uh, I can ask that, Professor Kuhn, uh, do you see a need to differentiate between skills for different medical specialties? Should there be a new specialty on digital medicine, uh, and, and totally new entity like uh, radiology maybe in the past? And should there be regulatory oversight of new digital health professionals by chambers, orders, councils? Please. Yes. Like, first of all, with like differentiating maybe various levels, I think I can maybe pick up the point where uh, we mentioned, oh, the young generation are digital natives and you might not be able to teach a new trick to an old dog. I think both things I would not uh, agree with. I think, first of all, um, the digital natives are not all digital natives. We have extremely bright minds and innovators who drive the field from, from a student perspective. But uh, in, in a large context, um, they do need a basic qualification in digital skills. And the same is true for, for older generation. I've taught doctors up to the, to the age of about 75 years old, the curriculum, and they can uh, learn a new trick. And um, as long as you make it as part of their profession and that it's about providing the best standard of care available at a time for their patients. And I think this is about the core requirement. And I think we do need different levels and we need to differentiate and we do that in our medical curriculum in Bielefeld now that we allow them also to acquire a bachelor degree where they can do really a deep dive and, uh, and really go deep into the digital medicine field. And I think the same is true, but rather at existing medical professions, um, as in radiologists, as in dermatologists, as in internal med specialists, and we will have people who go really deep into, into medicine. I'm a professor of digital medicine, but I don't think that we need the doctor for digital medicine, as we might have needed the radiologist. I think it's more of a change that takes part in all different fields, but we do need deep dives and we do programs now with a, a clinical scientist program, but also to implement it with the different medical associations into their residency program, into their subspecialties to really drive the change through existing structures. And at this level, um, I would like to pick up the point that we need to innovate with patients, with different healthcare professionals, with scientists, with informatics. And the idea is about co-design. And this can be really well implemented into the deep type curriculums at a medical level as getting a, a doctor degree, but also at the clinical scientist level where we can really um, educate but also create innovation at the same time with a very diverse group who are relevant for digital medicine. 
And yeah. and you mentioned about um, the new jobs. I think there will be new jobs, and we shouldn't run into the same mistake we made with maybe the academ uh, academic nursing. I think when we create new digital health um, um, studies, as in bachelor's and master's, we need to think about jobs. And I, I worked on that in the last year and a half very intensively. And in that field, we do need a regulation. We do need uh, a structure, how it will fit into, the, into the, the, the care of patients. If we miss on that, we miss a great chance to really drive change and innovation and a real interprofessional approach. Yeah, thank you. Just, and with the, with the uh, question for, for a brief answer, a short answer, We've had experience with the IT, with the controllers, uh, with the people from the economic side. Mm -hmm. The question was always, should we train doctors to be also good accountants and good uh, economists, or should we take economists uh, and introduce them into medicine? If you look into your field, would you rather have a physician with extra training in IT, uh, or would you rather have an IT specialist uh, uh, with extra training in medicine? What do you think is the, the, the profession of the future of the future yeah i think we need both and most importantly they need to be able to speak the same language and i think this has been a problem we've had uh, met informatics for 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 decades now and we've had doctors on the other side but they did not really speak the same language and we had very little benefit really on the patient side as a new diagnostic um, opportunities as a new therapeutic uh, opportunity. So I think we need to come from both sides, but we need to be able to speak the same language. So I think at the deep dive curriculum, um, we need to think more about combined degrees where maybe each specialty has their um, specialized program, but they need to be joined in together. And I think this is, a, this is an opportunity we have now with the digital transformation. Yeah, thank you. I hear all our discussions are back. Uh, so I risk uh, putting a question to Jörg Dibatin uh, at this one. Jörg, uh, of course, uh, as you are representing government in a way here, we come with the obvious question, and that is who should bear the costs of the digital transformation in healthcare? What innovative developments in the German government are to support uh, the financial burden of um, a, a digital initiative in healthcare? Uh, yes, indeed, I'm, I'm back, and um, um, I, I was just uh, following the very interesting comments of uh, Sebastian, and uh, again, um, I'd like to echo the fact that we really need to bring the different uh, sort of uh, actors together to have the best uh, uh, solution, digital care. Now, who's, who should pay for this? Um, you know, there there is, um, um, if you look at it from an institutional point of view, let's say you are a medical center and you try to sort of digitize, um, clearly there is a lot of sort of run-up costs initially, um, and uh, these costs will eventually pay out in uh, more efficient uh, uh, processes and uh, in just um, 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 sort of uh, uh, less effort uh, that needs to be uh, spent in bringing together data, et cetera. Um, now, having recognized the fact that there is the need for an initial investment, uh, at least the German government has uh, set apart, has, has set, set aside a fair amount of money um, to really cover these costs, these initiation costs. Um, um, and and um, as, as the government does so for the ambulatory sector, now um, the German government has uh, allocated 4.3 billion uh, uh, euros for um, the digitization for digitization wave, a digitization initiative in the hospital sector. Um, um, once this initiation is over, the costs don't stop because uh, then you have um, you know you have maintenance costs. But um, I think then it's really up for to healthcare providers to make sure that they cover these maintenance costs with the uh, savings that they have um, by being more efficient. And you know, at the end of the day, one of the big drivers for digital medicine, beyond the fact that uh, we want to make life more comfortable, we want to make sure that patients live longer with less pain, with less disease, it's also uh, to cope with the demographic challenges uh, that we're confronting, i.e. Um, we, we, we know that um, if we just project uh, linear costs in a linear and, and uh, cost, uh, healthcare costs in a linear fashion, that we won't be able to pay for it. So we have to become more efficient. We have to become more productive. And uh, digital tools will actually help us to, to, to achieve that goal. But again, um, there is an initial cost. There is the initiation cost. And that is something that the government, at least in Germany, bears. 
um, which I think is a, is is a very is, is money very well spent. Um, and then um, it's really part of everybody's uh, uh, daily life. And um, um, then it really sort of becomes uh, uh, the, the tool that you need not only to improve medicine, but as I said, to also become more productive. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. That was a comprehensive answer. I would now like to come back uh, to Marco Marcella because uh, uh, we had this uh, breakup of, in the middle of your statement. So um, I'm awfully sad, but please try to wrap up the remainder of your statement which you wanted to give us, but also include the question, uh, uh, to what extent can digital skills be addressed in EU initiatives? And what is going to be the doctor's role when things go wrong? Should their level of responsibility, for instance, be linked to special digital skills? Please, uh, you have the floor again, and I hope this time you will stay with us. <laughs> I, I hope it's a so. nasty it's a nasty word that when the commission speaks everything breaks up but i didn't say that so please, <laughs> please go ahead so, so yeah yeah thank you I, i'm so sorry also because i i have no idea when the systems uh, broke in a way so uh, just to wrap up the the comments uh, so my, my comments i hope that it, it, it was clear that i was uh, uh, insisting very much on the possibilities to uh, to manage a trustful access to data and to digital services, and uh, in 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 having a in having a, in, an ecosystem that is trusted, you do need uh, capacities uh, to develop that trustworthiness, and these capacities, uh, of course, are technological capacities, as we were saying before, but they are also capacities in terms of uh, human resources. So skills, uh, it is an important component of this. Uh, uh, of, of, of the set of initiatives that the Commission is, uh, is, is, is contributing to the, to, to the digital transformation. Um, and as you were saying before, not only uh, for the inclusion part, so the digital inclusions for, for every citizen, but also for, uh, uh, the, the, for, for specific sector curricula. So if we look at the digital Digital transformation of the digital transformations that we see, for instance, in one of the programs that the Commission put forward for the next, uh, let's say, financial uh, uh, framework, the Digital Euro program, there we do have specific actions uh, for deployment with the member states on artificial intelligence, on uh, cybersecurity, which we mentioned. You cannot talk about trustfulness if you are, do not, not have the capacity systems and the data that is in the information systems to the highest level, uh, we have computing capacity, like for, for, for instance, high performance computing, and we do have uh, sections on uh, building capacities for digital skills, uh, with specific, for instance, interventions at the highest, uh, at, the, at, at, at the curriculum level, for instance, in uh, for the medical sector, I think that this would maybe be part uh, of the support, and the financial envelope is also quite important. And, and as you rightly say, the, the, the rationale for uh, having that intervention, well, it's not only uh, because of, uh, uh, let's say, the importance of digital for the workforce in general, but it is important, and we have seen this under the COVID pandemic, for the uptake of these technological solutions in health and care settings. Just think about uh, the technological solutions for uh, CT scans uh, that would very fast analyze the, the scans and provide uh, the, the, the radiologist with the classifications of the images to diagnose the, uh, the, the pneumonia, the, 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 the bilateral interstitial pneumonia. There you, you just don't need the, the technology. You need, you need to have the capacity to absorb that technologies in healthcare settings. So you have to have the infrastructure for that. You have to have the people that are able to support that infrastructure and you have to have the capacities uh, of, of the operators uh, to master with the digital skills those technological solutions. And we see that this is a, a trend that we need to, um, to, to, to support even further. Uh, in, in relation to, uh, uh, to, um, to the, the, the regular framework, as we were saying before, I think that this is the, 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 the subject of intervention next year for uh, the AI uh, package, but also for the European Health Data Speed. Um, we heard this morning from, from, from Minister Spahn. We will be discussing the issues of putting into the market technological solutions that are safe, that are effective, 
uh, uh, that are bound to values that we have, like the European Charter for Fundamental Rights, and uh, uh, after all, on how this will actually, uh, how these technologies they do interact with the users, with those the populations that is going to use that. So this will be, uh, in my opinion, of the of the package that we will see in 2021. Thank you, thank you very much, Marco, for this comprehensive answer. And there were one or two stutters in the communication in between, not, not on your side, but on the electronic side. So I was a bit afraid we would have a, a breakup uh, again. Could I go back uh, to uh, um, thanking you for this intervention? Could I go back to uh, Mrs. Linda Keane? Uh, you have mentioned uh, CPD and e-skills. And uh, in the e-skills for professionals report, you recommended a further uptake by the member states. And now directly after the uh, um, spokesperson for the Commission, are you aware of any plans of an uptake of CPD to uh, keep up in this very fast-moving target? Because sometimes in some apps we have releases every six weeks. In some programs we have releases once a year. Uh, doctors are already overburdened with work. We have a lot of burnout in some areas of medicine. How can we keep up uh, with this fast-moving target? Uh, is, are there any programs known to you from member states? Um, okay, uh, just a, a few points in, in relation to that. I mean, um, you know, the, the whole CPD process is, is well established in, in, in medicine, but th there's no reason why that can't be applied to um, lifelong learning and continuous professional development um, around uh, digital skills. Um, there are various competence frameworks in use around the world um, by subsectors of, of the medical profession. Um, uh, there's there's um, a, a very um, a, a very big online uh, repository um, hit comp in the, in the US that's used both by um, uh, practicing um, health professionals, but also by anybody looking to develop training um, or the medical schools. Um, and it's a, it's a repository of, of a thousand competences that, that the health, uh, that, that could be used by, the, by health professionals. Um, and then there are, you know, a competence framework, it, it lists the, the knowledge and skills items that you would need to do particular tasks. It can be quite focused right down to a single task or it can it can describe a role or it can describe um, a profession or it can describe the, the breadth of, of the health profession and uh, there are um, various different manifestations of that um, in, in operation, some um, the, the professional um, membership organisations push their own um, their own frameworks. Like I said, there's a there's a, a big one in the US. In Australia, they they developed um, uh, these kind of capability framework, which is kind of higher level statements from which you would develop more detailed um, specs for for particular professions. So um, there's various different flavors of competence framework, but the procedure um, and how you embed it into C CPD processes uh, is kind of the same. So it's it's there as a kind of scaffold or structure against which a doctor or a health professional at any stage in their career can reference it and measure themselves against it. So, you know, if you, quite simply, if you want to get somewhere, you can't figure out how to get there unless you um, know where you're starting from. So that's that starting from point is you measuring yourself against um, uh, an, an, an up-to-date um, and recognised competence framework. Um, you do, it's, a, it's an, an assessment exercise and you match, I'm at such and such a level. Um, competence frameworks can cover like tasks which are quite routine and every day, but can go right up into quite specialised um, specialised areas. And you know what what Professor Kuhn was saying earlier on about basic skills versus the deep dive. I mean, I couldn't agree more with with what he was saying. Um, I personally feel competence frameworks come into their own when 
um, when you're talking about these deep dive um, specialities and people can map themselves at a number of different levels depending on their level of autonomy and their technical expertise and so on. So, you know, in a, in a, in a process, like I said, that can be repeated many times throughout your career. Um, you can take a picture of yourself or develop your competence profile at a point in time measured against a, a competence framework. You can also use that same competence framework to identify, okay, well, I need to get to such a, to such a level um, because you can, um, you can pull out a set of competences for a role perhaps that, that you need to aspire to. And the difference, you know, the gap is, is what you need to travel to get from where you are to where you to where you need to be. And that gap is where the, the, the plan of action is is um, is developed. You either do that personally um, um, for your own development or, uh, you know, as, as, as part of a, a systematic C CPD process, you would do that with a, with a manager or a supervisor or a, um, a team leader or your CIO or, or whatever. Um, and that, that plan of action is where um, you can then seek out professional development opportunities, training opportunities and map them against what you need by using those competence, the expressions of those competences in the framework. Um, the training provider similarly use that competence framework as a reference for building the training provision. So it's, it, it, is, it is all connected. Similarly, rolling back to the, um, the medical schools can also reference the same competence framework to ensure that they're covering the competences that a, that a doctor will need um, when they start practicing, they can cover that back in back in medical school. So again, this is you, you map your plan of action and then you you do it. You seek out the training inter interventions. You do the you know maybe informal professional development activities that are, that also count. It's all part of the big picture. And then like a cycle, you come back again and you do a similar self assessment exercise to see where you are now with the idea that you will you will have progressed. And this iterative approach, maybe it happens annually, maybe it happens, you know, um, at, at uh, longer um, interventions, but that it, that it keeps happening um, throughout throughout your um, career. It's not just a, there's a new system coming in, I need to learn this new system and that's that. Um, it is it is part of an ongoing um, an ongoing um, cycle. That um, in the, the project, the e-health action task that we did around competence frameworks, we got in a pilot, we got the 180 health professionals to do the first step, the competence self-assessment um, exercise. And you're right, we did at the end, you know, reflected on our results and, and, and made some suggestions um, about maybe pushing that pilot out um, to take in the further steps or to broaden it out to broaden it out further, we did it in four countries and you know maybe broaden it out that way. But I think um, in the eHealth Action project, what they're doing now is there is a there is a specific task that's focusing on sustainability post-2021 scenarios, and they're taking the recommendations from a number of tasks, including this one, and they're looking at okay, how can we bring this forward, make sure that the, the work continues. Um, and that you know, its conclusions are not just written up in a nice report and, and left on a shelf. So there is a specific group um, looking looking at that, and there are some activities and workshops in relation to that planned planned in the new year. But I think where it, this this is recommendations for the eHealth network, and I think where their strength is is in the linkages that we spoke about earlier. So they can be a link. Um, and the mechanism to bring all of the stakeholders um, together. Yeah. Th thank you very much. You have a very comprehensive answer, and we are a little bit running short of time because I know that Vilja Pietjan has to leave us in, in a few seconds because she has another appointment. So, with your permission, I would just like to pose uh, the last question to her, uh, Vilja. If you were in the possession of a crystal ball and you could look into the crystal ball now, what will the future of uh, digital skills education in Finland and Europe be in the future? Could you just give us a brief answer? Yes. So well, well, I hope that we would we would have the the, the digital tools there as a real tools to kind of facilitate uh, first of all 
the, the, the work of the clinicians in the hospital and, and, and that the training can, can support this, that it's, 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 it's um, facilitated, uh, not making things more complicated as such. And then on the other hand, I, I really look forward to the precision medicine type of the personalized treatment options and also like um, how we can actually improve the health of the patient by using these tools. And, and of course, for this all, we need uh, very much of critical thinking as such uh, ethical points. Um, uh, we have to be uh, sure for the, for the security of, of, of uh, everything what we do. But then on the other hand, uh, we have to also be honest that we need a lot of cap capabilities uh, so that we have the supporting infra there. And I think that it's, it's still something what um, kind of together with the training and the training we're creating, we will need is that in the hospitals, we would have a better biosystems for this type of digital data. We have good health, uh, health uh, record systems already, but sometimes they don't have a good or very easy crosstalk, for example, with mobile devices and so on. Sometimes there's not enough of computing capacity which come up at the EU level uh, and, 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 and so on. So, so really like creating the ecosystem and, and I'm making the, then the students uh, of, of, of medicine to, to be able to use it. And then on the other hand, I think that there's lots of interactions needed and, and I hope that in the future we will see different type of the, the, the experts working much more together, uh, computing, computing people with the computing skills, people uh, uh, from the from the bio biosciences, uh, different uh, uh, areas of the healthcare, and, and and by combining the courses together, so to make these people already like when stu when 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 doing their studies to talk together, I, I really believe that then we can also enhance the use and 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 uh, kind of uh, uh, improve the how 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 the impact of the of the digitalization in in in, in healthcare. And, and at the end, I, I, I think that's very important is, is also kind of bring uh, the industry together here and, and, and talk together with them uh, what already came up with the regulation parts, but also, uh, also to kind of um, uh, make such a, for example, the tools which are now used by, by, by customers, I would say so, with future patients, uh, they, they use their own del, uh, digital health devices and they come with this data to the doctor, how to interpret this data. Uh, in the clinics and how to kind of what would be the doctor's response to this data? I think this is something what we hope that we can we can teach by by critical thinking uh, by by guiding. Thank you, Vidya, for this uh, uh, intervention. And uh, before we now, I put the final question of this round uh, to um, to uh, Lina Mosh. Uh, I would like to repeat. Uh, the hashtag uh, on Twitter, I forgot to say it was on Twitter, so awfully sorry, but on Twitter you can now put your questions on hash CPME digital skills, and we will go into a round of questions and answers uh, directly after the last question, which I would like to put to Lina Mosh. We have started with the students' perspective, and I think it's a good overarching theme that we finish uh, this round with the students' perspective as well. And I have a, a two-tired question. The first thing is, you heard a lot about ethical implications of algorithms, of construction, uh, of um, teaching. Do you think this is uh, sufficiently recognized in the e-health training which you receive nowadays? And a little second question also, interprofessionality has been mentioned, and we are not talking about other academic professions, also about nurses, midwives, all the other professions. Do you think that there is enough representation of interprofessional education in the current curricula in the universities you know? Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, and I think, as I answered the question in the beginning with no, uh, we do not feel, feel well prepared for working in a digitalized healthcare system. I sadly have to respond to those two questions also with no. Uh, at the moment, uh, we don't have uh, enough um, courses on ethical aspects of e-health and also not enough courses for interprofessional education, but um, luckily uh, there are dynamics and um, for example, related to the ethical aspects, we actually saw in our survey that um, this is the era where the most respondents said that there are courses already. So m the majority of 50% said they have ethical courses on digital health topics. Um, and uh, with relation to interprofessionalism, I think this is 
really a key factor because um, this interprofessional collaboration is a very important facilitator also for the implementation of uh, digital health technologies in a clinical setting. So we have um, all those multi-professions uh, that are already working together now and with the digital transformation it, this becomes only more fragmented, more specialized and um, like we heard from a lot of panelists today, we do not need a doctor who is able to program or to code an algorithm um, or um, to be able to uh, oversee all the, the, the laws that are there for digital health uh, in, in, in uh, health, but we need uh, doctors that are able to assess the basics of digital technologies on the one hand, who are able to, to oversee uh, data science and understand the mechanisms of algorithms, and on the other side have also the competency to, yeah, the, the communication competencies to talk and to um, be empathetic with the patient and see the needs of the patient. And I think this will expand um, when we have the digital transformation of healthcare. And especially um, we need um, a doctors that know who to ask for help, so um, that are able to communicate and work in a multidisciplinary team um, with data scientists, uh, with engineers and uh, nurses, of course, with all, all the professions that are to, to come still. So, so uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Linda. I think this was a very uh, inspiring view of the future, and I think this is one of the things where also my profession, our profession, has to learn in the communication and cooperation with uh, other professionals in our field. Now, this concludes our, uh, our panel round. We would now like to open up for questions and answers, and I have been told that the first uh, person online uh, and uh, ready to talk to us is Ray Wally. Ray Wally, who originally was supposed to stay here and, uh, and uh, moderate this discussion, but couldn't come due to COVID uh, and quarantine restrictions. Uh, Ray, uh, I hope you're online now and we can hear and see you and you can put the question to the panel, which uh, I have been told you have uh, ready. And I still see our, our three us three here. Do we have Ray Wally online? Okay. No, not yet. So we can come with a question which I can see from Heidro and Gitter. She has put a question. Uh, would you agree that the role of the medical profession, especially in setting the regulatory framework according to patients and physicians' needs, can only be backed by involving the National Medical Associations and CPME. This question is asked from Heidrun Gitta, and she doesn't say to whom. Heidrun, if you would put this question to me, of course I would definitely say yes. This is one of the prime roles of the medical associations uh, in Europe, and of course of CPME, as the representation of doctors in Europe uh, to set the regulatory framework uh, in, uh, for the medical profession, but of course for lots of the technicalities, for the liability, for litigation issues, uh, uh, there are other regulators uh, that have to give the governance structures. Uh, Jörg, uh, have you heard the question? Is, do you have a uh, similar opinion or would you say it should all be done by government uh, or is it uh, a question where uh, I know we had good contacts uh, with the associations, the medical associations. That, that was when the payroll issue came up <laughs> every now and then. But uh, please give us your opinion on should that be more done by the medical profession? I mean, only for the doctors. Uh, or is it a governance problem of government? No, obviously it, it, it needs to involve uh, medical professionals uh, really in all levels, but also increasingly patients. And, um, you know, with digitization, there is a change also in the ability of patients to participate in their own care. We've heard about, you know, Fitbits, um, um, sort of uh, personal health um, instruments, gadgets that patients have. And uh, with that, they actually, the, 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 the requirements and, and the, the wishes that patients have with regard to their health care actually get augmented. They become more sovereign with regard to their decisions. So let's not forget them. Let's bring them in as much as we can. But, you know, in Germany, we have a very good tradition of um, most regulations really 
being um, um, implemented, developed and implemented by um, um, sort of the different stakeholders in the healthcare system. And only if that doesn't work, uh, the government sort of steps in. Um, with regard to digital medicine, quite frankly, we haven't done so well. And that's why the government did step in in a, in a major way over the last two years. Um, I, I, I would hope that uh, we are embracing these changes and clearly we need to involve all the stakeholders. And as we do so, we, we can't stop on the institutional level. I found it extraordinarily helpful to really go down to those and speak with those uh, individuals who actually do the day-to-day -day work, who actually are in private practice, seeing patients all day long and asking and talking to them and understanding their needs and their problems and their wishes and uh, thereby then um, sort of translating that into what is needed on a regulatory basis, but also on a technology basis um, to make medicine better uh, for, for, for all participants. So, you know, yes, as much involvement um, as, as we can of all sort of participants in the healthcare uh, environment, but then also let's, let's, let's go down to, to all of those individuals to really uh, do, the, to do the patient, to do the work, actually do interact with patients um, in hospitals, uh, uh, nursing, um, physiotherapists, um, uh, as well as physicians of course on all levels so and, and, and the more interaction we have the more we learn and as we sort of understand their needs then try to sort of uh, involve and uh, not just try but definitely involve patients in this equation more and more as their aspirations have really uh, increased and they will continue to increase um, with uh, um, an increasing um, uh, digital with the in increasing uh, digital transparency that they have as uh, you know having part uh, partaking in their care with their electronic patient record system with um, uh, a digital uh, prescription of drugs with now as we have in Germany over the last four weeks now the first apps that can be prescribed so a physician can not only sort of prescribe medication but also an app which of course is very new to physicians and that's why we need that training we need um, um, everything that was said before as a continuous sort of a training module um, in addition to that though um, the patients will become more demanding and we need to involve them more uh, thank you i think that was very important uh, at the end also the demands uh, and the respect for uh, the desires of the patients. Thank you. Marco, uh, can I ask you the same question, put the same question to you, who should be doing the regulatory framework? And then I can see Ray is uh, online now, then he can put his questions after your answer. Marco, please, and w with asking you for a brief answer, if that's possible. Uh, yes, well, then I just want to, uh, to, to, to build up on these words, say, that there are the more we learn. This is a process uh, uh, that is uh, a, a transformative by nature. So the, the only way that you can develop something and make sure that that technological solution, it is taken up within a certain boundaries is because you have developed it together or you wanted to use it. And uh, it, it, the examples of this interaction is, for instance, on this group that the commission set up, it's called the, the e-health stakeholder group, listening to voice and coming up with joined up approaches even within uh, within member states because uh, it, it is it is this, this concept of interacting and showing what works and how it is of paramount importance for uh, the collective uh, evolutions in Europe on the digital transformation. Very important answer. Now Ray, I already mentioned earlier on that you were supposed to be here in my place uh, but uh, due to the COVID restrictions you couldn't come but please do ask your question now. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Monty. And you're doing a brilliant job. Not an easy job, so well done. Fantastic. Uh, before I ask my question, I'm going to make an observation. I'm a family practitioner in Dublin, and uh, that dreaded word COVID hasn't been used very often here, but when COVID hit Ireland, it was in the area where I work. And it was quite interesting that we went from a 100% face-to-face to a 100% by telemedicine, but now uh, although we're in an orange area in the EU, EU, we've reverted back to 70% uh, face to face. And what I've noted is the importance of so important maintaining face to face medicine. And uh, then the digital uh, technology is a tool, but we need to, especially for mental health, maintain that face to face uh, medical link. So um, my question is to Marco uh, is how would we ensure that digital transition does not translate? into the digital divide in healthcare between member states and how the Commission would plan to mitigate the financial 
and social disparities in Europe? Uh, please uh, go thank ahead. you. You see, so um, um, I, I would probably bring it to the I would use for this answer the examples of developing digital content raising up that are now being made interoperable across Europe. They are part of the response uh, to, to COVID. This uh, exercise uh, um, uh, has been driven by the member states with reflections. Uh, in more than 100 meetings uh, since uh, March, uh, in making sure that we develop a common approach to the evolutions, but also how to develop, for instance, the, uh, the, 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 the back office uh, in the member states, and how to develop the link to make sure that certain kind of data can actually be shared. Well, then, what I can assure you that the real uh, uh, exercise today, in quite regular time, to have Applications developed, uh, Germany is, for instance, leading in this sense, and Ireland is leading in that sense, uh, uh, across Europe, which have been developed in a way that then uh, those apps can actually also exchange data for making sure that people in different member states uh, can just use one app and um, now up and running. It's also is only because there has been a, an important effort in making sure that there was these coordinations with the member states within a network of member states called the e-health network. So uh, it is it is through these kind of collaborations that I'm, I'm pretty sure that even in terms of interoperability, access to data, making sure that technological solutions can be, for instance, the, uh, analyzing the regulatory landscape of digital uh, health service provisions in Europe, which uh, so it is in, in essence uh, tackling the fragmentations that we see in this panorama to build an ecosystem that actually works can only be done by this uh, coordinated approach with the member states, of, of which uh, the, 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 you know, not local age evolutions will be taken, but also the way in which this will be used in the member states, in the regions, and at the local level. Um, it, it, it is part of this exercise. So the exchange of practices, as I said, the Commission does not have a, uh, specific competence in the health services, has been found of paramount importance to make sure that they, even in the context of the digital contact tracing app, we now have a joined up approach. Thank you, Marco. Uh, we have a question from Romania, but bef before I read out the question to you, I would like uh, to emphasize uh, what Ray said, that uh, from 100% face-to-face to 100% face-to-technology, we should now move to a 70-30 distribution. We worded that in, in, in our German context. We said that the gold standard is still the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, contact between a physician and, uh, and his patient, or his or her patient. But um, the question from Romania, which butts in into this issue, is what will be the ethical limits of medical responsibility in telemedical examination? And I think that's a question where uh, Sebastian could give us, uh, try to give us an answer. Sebastian, yes. please go ahead. I'd very much like to pick up the, pick up the ball here. Ray mentioned basically 100% face-to-face, 200% um, digital. And I think when we think about the ethical responsibility of doctors, it's not really that much tied to the technology. It's to provide the best, best possible care to their patient under any circumstances. So it's not a question if um, you're seeing a patient or if you're seeing a patient digitally. Um, in the second week of March, I woke up very early one morning and exactly that problem came up to my mind because up to that point it was if you're sick, go see a doctor and suddenly it was if you feel sick stay at home don't come to in our office we'll call you and we know a telephone call is not really possible to detect if the patient is having a severe course is developing a COVID pneumonia if it's having thromboembolic complications and Jörg and his team at the Health Innovation Hub they've been a very agile driver of a new chance, of a new tool that was given to, our, uh, to us as doctors this year. And that was also, for me, the starting point for, for a development. I developed um, a smartphone application which allows home monitoring, basically including of pulse ox, of temperature, of pulse rate into uh, an app. And that information is transferred to the GP who's looking after the patient through a data secure point. And this enables to augment 
the doctor's ability via phone call with vitals that can make a decision, is it safe for the patient to stay at home, which 94% of the patients are, or should that patient be admitted now to the hospital because the pulse rate, the pulse ox is below 94, and not only in, in two or three days when the patient says, I can't cope anymore. And we developed within five days, we developed a prototype within three months, uh, a medical device, and now we're implementing it into several GP offices and the university care. So it's very much about agility and to provide the best possible care. If patients can come to the office, that's great, and that's also my preference. But if patients are remote or they're in a nursing home, we cannot allow to offer second quality care through telephone calls, but we have to use technology in order to provide the best possible care. This is ethical. Yes, thank you. I think that is important because ethics is not only a theoretical thing, it is also a very practical thing when it comes down to breaking it down to the patient-physician uh, yes. patient relationship. Next question, which is very interesting. Uh, I'm a little bit cynical about it. It comes from EMSA and it says, how do you evaluate the progress of implementation of digital health in medical education and the licensing regulation for doctors? Now, the question is, how do you evaluate something that up to now doesn't exist, the progress of implementation of digital health? Who, who would like to answer to that question? I see Vilja, you are still with us, uh, and Linda. Is there anyone you know who evaluates, if that means monitors and ranks the progress of implementation of digital health, or isn't it too early to start a process uh, where we are all uh, in the middle of a storm of implementation? Please, Vilja. Yes, so just um, maybe coming to our, our programs in Finland, so of course with a specific courses, but, but also what comes to this uh, bigger, bigger program, which is, which is the national program to, to set for, uh, for digital health training and education. There's uh, an important aspect of, 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 uh, of analysis done, how it is actually um, implement, implemented in different faculties, for example, the faculty level in different, uh, different universities uh, or different medical faculties at different universities. So there has to be a scoring method. So one, one method is, for, for example, to score if, if all the courses, so there are like separate course program now made, and if all these separate courses are organized and how they are organized, if they organize, this is one thing, like how the training itself uh, has to be also scored and, 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 and that it's given in the similar manner, manner of course. And then the other, other thing is that there has to be self-evaluation of the training itself for the teachers. And then also there's always the evaluation, uh, how, how well the students are learning. But then, of course, what comes up to the kind of uh, more national or in, even international standards, uh, this I think that there would be other people answering to the, to the international level or European level standards in this type of the training. And I think this has to be, has to be kind of discussed in the, in the wider manner, the international setup. Thank you. Evaluation, uh, Linda, what is your opinion on that? Um, evaluating, uh, evaluating the training, is, as you have described, I mean, I'm not aware of anything at a kind of international level where they're evaluating the, the, the training and the development of, of doctors in terms of their digital skills. Um, I, I suppose in a in a different profession from a European perspective, there's the European e-competence framework, which is it is a competence framework um, and it, it um, maps the, the competences for the IT profession. And that has been made um, that has been made it's a European standard. So Europe are saying this is this is the standard um uh, for for IT profession um, across the profession, and it it, um, it states the competences. So although not quite exactly what you're talking about, um, it is it is a, a like a European stamp or, or the standard against uh, the attainment of skills for IT professionals. But um, I'm not aware th there isn't the equivalent, obviously for. Um, for digital skills and, and health professionals. I suppose in evaluating the success or not of something, um, 
you know, in terms of acquiring digital skills and um, the, the validation and validating the, the acquisition of those skills is, is important and that often leads to some kind of assessment or certification. Um, it, it, it focuses the mind and it's been kind of proved again and again, certification, the, the value of that um, as opposed to leaving something, you know, open-ended, if you like, for for um, for people just to 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 go and maybe do a a block of training with no endpoint in, in sight and no formalised way of of, of a, a assessing whether the person has actually acquired those skills or not. Um, you know, certification does it, it still remains um, a, a very good tool and an objective method of of finding out whether somebody has reached a certain a certain um, skill level. Um, so, thank yeah, you, Linda. I mean, I think that, that, that was important. Amazing. Thank you. Now, and I would like to play this question back uh, to the students because uh, it came from EMSA. And I know that Linda was uh, very uh, instrumental. Lina was very instrumental in uh, organizing uh, the implementation programs. So, with the demand, with the request for a very brief answer, uh, you have uh, you have implemented programs. Who evaluates them, and what happens there? Um, uh, I actually would like to point out um, the, the the circle which uh, Linda also described earlier. That it's uh, it's about evaluating, but it's uh, first of all about assessing the situation, uh, which the e action has done, uh, and then coming up with solutions to the problem that that have been uh, identified. Um, in our case, learning objectives and the catalogs of learning objecti objectives, and I think that's also a very good tool, um, yeah, to monitor and uh, to uh, also to evaluate. Um, the implementation of digital health and medical education. And I would like to uh, draw a special attention also to the university hospitals, which uh, in my opinion have a special role here as uh, lighthouses, kind of because they merge the real implementation of digital health uh, technologies into clinical settings, but also the research, they are on the forefront of, of developing digital te technologies as well, and they educate and uh, formate the future generation of physicians. So. Um, I think they, that university hospitals and, and deans and, and all the people that are involved there should take this role very seriously and um, should um, also monitor and evaluate their progress through exchanging best practices. For instance, there has been a deans meeting of 28 European deans uh, in 2019 in Rotterdam where um, we worked uh, together with students, educators and, and deans and also industry and the commission, so everyone kind of was there. And uh, I think this is the kind of platforms and the kind of um, yeah, collaboration we need in order to really learn from one another and also connect the European and the national level, the students um, and doctors and the industry um, yeah, for the sake of the, the matter. Yes, thank you very much. Also, a very interesting answer. Um, now, we have uh, come up uh, to the end uh, of our discussion. Uh, and I would like to thank all panelists, uh, those that were listening in from home or from their offices, those that were here at uh, um, the podium here in the Bundesherzekammer in Berlin. I would like to thank all of you for your contributions. I think it was a very interesting uh, and well-designed uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope to see all of you again. Uh, there is a 70 to 30 chance that we will have face-to-face -face meetings again, not as patients and, and physicians, but as uh, human beings and see each other and discuss this issue uh, on a personal level. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much for your participation. And it is now my honor and privilege uh, to introduce to you uh, our next speaker. Uh, you know that um, we haven't uh, talked very much about the patient's perspective uh, on these issues and therefore it is a great honor for me that uh, Professor Claudia Schmidtke has come to us. She is a member of the German Parliament, uh, the German Bundestag.
but she has also been appointed as Commissioner for Patients Affairs of the German federal government. So she is the representative of uh, patient issues in Parliament here in uh, Germany. She is, has trained as a, a cardiac surgeon. She is working as a cardiac surgeon at a hospital in Lübeck uh, in northern uh, Germany, but of course being Commissioner for Patients and being a member of Parliament uh, it's, uh, it's quite a time-taking time job, so we are very pleased and honored that you've come to us. Uh, Claudia Schmidtke, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Montgomery, um, dear Dr. Reinhardt, distinguished ladies and uh, gentlemen. First off, um, I would like to express my most sincere thanks to the organizers for responding with such flexibility uh, to the unique requirements of the coronavirus pandemic and for making this event possible uh, in this format. In my function as the Federal Commissioner for Patients Affairs, I am very pleased to speak to you as a doctor and colleague about patients' demands regarding the digital transformation using Germany as an example. To begin with, Patients generally view the digital transformation as something positive. Many people, above, uh, above all the younger, pretty much demand such services. This was a result of a representative survey of 1,200 um, people in May of this year, commissioned by the Bitcom Digital Association. Around two-thirds of respondents felt that digital health services needed to be expanded faster in Germany. 60% believed that Germany was behind other countries in terms of digitalizing their healthcare system. However, we must always bear in mind that this willingness is highly dependent on pay people trusting the digitalization processes and those in charge of their data. In order to establish and maintain this trust over the long term, the framework must be clearly defined. Here, three things need to be remembered. First, data belong to the patients. They alone may determine how these are to be used. Second, the use of digital services must be voluntary. Patients must be given transparent and comprehensive information regarding the opportunities and potential risks of digital services. Only then can they make a self-determined decision for or against their use. In this connection, one point is critical for me. If people decide against such use for whatever reason, then this must not place them at a disadvantage. Since many older people did not grow up with digital media, there are some that never mastered them. And thirdly, the use of this data must encompass the best possible legal and technical protection against misuse. I am aware that there is no such thing as absolute security. Data protection violations must be prosecuted and punished vigorously. If these framework conditions are met, then the foundations are laid for patients to not only enjoy a tangible added value from digitalization, but also to feel secure when using digital services. What such an added value might look like for patients in concrete terms and what demands from a patient perspective should be passed on to the doctors. I wish to briefly clarify using three key areas. First, digital health literacy. The digital transformation and patients' increasing autonomy is leading to more of them actively searching for health information online. According to the Federal Statistical Office, two out of three people use the Internet to research health topics. This makes health information searches in uh, the Germany population's third most frequent online activity. A representative survey from this year also shows that every second person looks up their symptoms online in preparation of a visit to the doctor. Interestingly, the proportion of those who check online or via an app after visiting the doctor is even higher, 61%. The main reasons are to look for a second opinion, alternative treatment options, or generally for additional information on the diagnosis, treatment, 
or disease. This gives us an example of how, in a best case scenario, using digital health and information services can lead to, or to growing health literacy among patients. However, there is a risk that information available online and or on health apps might be incomplete, not quality assured and, in the worst case, even false. Googling symptoms cannot replace a medical degree or long-standing professional experience. Digital health information can only be a useful added source of information if the patient then examines, classifies, and evaluates it together with a doctor. It is therefore important that doctors take seriously the new concept of a responsible digital patient and examine online health information themselves to be able to recommend reliable online sources. Another example that I wish to mention is that patients also increasingly expect digitalization in everyday care at surgeries and hospitals. For instance, this includes modern communication methods and the possibility to make appointments online based on secure IT infrastructures. One key aspect here is also digital documentation in the form of the electronic patient record. Patients experience problems mostly when outpatient and inpatient care intersect because all of the parties involved might not have immediate access to the information needed for their case. For the first time, the electronic patient record providers insured persons with quick access to their medical data, their diagnosis or their vac vaccination record. The doctors providing treatment and service providers, on the other hand, always have access to all the information they need on pre-existing conditions, diagnosis, previous operations, medication taken or allergies. This leads to a better cross-sectoral overview of an individual patient's health record without having to fax or post test results or medical records. This eases decision-making, simplifies working processes and contributes toward efficient and safe patient care. The electronic health record can, however, only fulfill its true potential if doctors are open to it and allow it to incrementally prove it, its usefulness in everyday healthcare in real time. Here, mistakes will surely be made and problems will surely rise. But this will help us to incrementally optimize the electronic health record and adapt it to the need, needs of all those involved. We cannot wait until everything is perfect in theory, because progress takes place in the clinical setting here and now. And this brings me to the third and last, and from a, perspective, uh, from a, from a patient perspective, no less important example the opportunities and possibilities of digitally integrated healthcare. Digitalization and integrated health data offer enormous potential, on the one hand for better diagnosis and treatment and on the other for research which, which ultimately benefits optimal patient healthcare. Rare diseases, which doctors often find quite difficult to identify, demonstrate the potential offered by digitalization. The search for the right diagnosis is like searching for the proverbial needle in the haystack. A search that can often mean years without a diagnosis or treatment, despite many doctors' visits and sometimes extremely elaborate diagnostic measures. This is because some diseases are so rare that even specialized centers only see a few cases. For optimal healthcare, it is important to combine the few data available on symptoms and symptom progression, for instance, with information on molecular pathology data. Next generation sequencing allows even as yet unknown genetic changes to be identified and linked to a disease picture. With the right information, researchers are able to develop innovative treatments faster and more efficiently. By analyzing large amounts of data, 
artificial intelligence and learning systems can help carry out the right diagnosis, select the best treatment, and better orient these towards patients. In other words, lead to personalized medicine. This clearly shows that data helps healing. Integrated healthcare research and the digital transformation can and will contribute toward better healthcare. That is a fact that we basically cannot ignore. Patients have a right to their data being used reliable in a way that is most useful to them. The current example of the video consultation shows that digital solutions can be successful with the right framework conditions and the awareness that healthcare needs to be broad based. During the coronavirus pandemic, more people have been willing to use and have shown acceptance for online video consultation than ever before in Germany. The development of online video consultation shows that the coronavirus virus pandemic, despite all its terrible consequences, has proven to be a real catalyst for digitalization in the healthcare sector. Digital services were and are able to demonstrate their worth in practice, for instance, by protecting patients and medical staff from infection and avoiding unnecessary journeys and waiting time. The coronavirus had led to many people in Germany changing their entire attitude towards digitalization. This was a key finding of a study on behalf of the Dig Digital für alle, Digitalization for All initiative to mark the occasion of the first nationwide digitalization day on June 19 of this year. According to the study, around three out of four respondents see digitalization as an opportunity. This represents an increase of five percentage points over the previous year. Germany should make use of this momentum. The Federal Ministry of Health will therefore put in motion another law involving a number of measures which will advance the framework conditions for digitalization. For telemedicine, digital health applica applications, the telematics infrastructure, uniform standards and interfaces, the electronic patient record and e-prescriptions. If we stay with example video consultation, the objective, amongst other things, is to further develop video consultation together with medical on-site healthcare. To that end, particularly with general family healthcare and long-term care, digital house calls and teleconsultations are to be facilitated. The previous usual limit for online video consultations is to be raised from 20% to 30% and billing and remuneration for telemedical services outside of office hours are also to be enabled. There are also plans to better inform insured persons on telemedical healthcare services and make these more readily accessible. A central coordination structure accessible across the country will be set up allowing doctors to enter available slots for video consultation and those insured to book the corresponding appointments. Enabling online video consultation with providers of medical assistance and midwives is also planned. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, even if we need it a little longer to get the digital transformation off the ground in Germany, it is now in full swing. The statutory framework conditions have and will be continuously adapted accordingly and there is no doubt that patients are willing. The fact is and remains, digital solutions hold no chance of success without doctors, providers of medical assistance and the other healthcare professions using such digital innovations in supporting their patients. That is why I'm very thankful that as part of this event, the important issues were discussed, such as how to promote and develop the digital skills of medical staff. As with patients, those treating them need information and instructions regarding the digital possibilities. I can understand that certain technologies and changes are initially received with skepticism. 
However, it is important that we approach digitalization with curiosity and then we openly communicate and weight up the risks and opportunities it holds on. Its opportunities are obvious. Technical solutions can take over organizationally necessary and repetitive tasks in the administration, recording, evaluation and transfer of data. As everyday healthcare becomes more and more complex. The digital transformation promises more efficient structures and therefore also more time for medical and care-related activities to benefit patients. Digital information technologies also allow for better recording of every patient's unique characteristics and course of treatment and have the potential to place medical treatment on a new and tailor-made foundation. If we look back in medical history, doctors have proven time and time again that in cooperation with other professional fields, they can translate technological innovations into useful and beneficial medical practice. This applies to the, intervention, to the invention of X-rays, just as it does to more modern imaging processes, minimal invasive surgery or robotics in the operating room. It has always been vital to scrutinize while remaining open to innovation whether these new technologies will improve the patient's care. If we continue to let this approach lead us, I am certain that we are on the right path to establishing digitalization as a key component for better patient care. In this spirit, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Schmidtke, for this intervention. Do you just allow one question? A brief one, a very brief one. I mean, in your, in your uh, first remarks, you stated that, of course, the patient has the right uh, not to accept uh, digital technologies. On the other hand, some patients' organizations consider it an act of empowerment of patients to improve health literacy. Are there any programs, not only for physicians, for nurses, for midwives, but also for other, for, for, for citizens, for ordinary people, so to say, to improve health literacy uh, in the field of uh, IT? This is a really good idea, and um, I, I will have a look at it. Um, I'm not quite sure if this exists, uh, but I will take the idea uh, at home. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. We thank you for these important comments. This concludes our discussion uh, with a very relevant message, uh, not only from the government, but also from uh, the patient uh, side. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schmidtke. And uh, it is now a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce to you uh, my friend Peter Bobbert, who is a member of the executive board of the German Medical Association. He will recap today's uh, discussion. Uh, he has earned special designations in internal medicine, in cardiology, uh, angiology, and has completed additional training in emergency medicine. He has been a senior physician at the Clinic for Internal Medicine at the Protestant Hospital in Hubertus in Berlin since 2014, and he is chair of the Committee for Digitalization and Healthcare and Medical Education and University Hospitals at the Bundesärztekammer. So he is ideally placed to summarize our debate. Peter, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Montgomery. Um, First of all, I would like to thank um, all the speakers for their fantastic presentations, and I would like to uh, thank uh, all the participants for the wonderful discussions we have heard today in the morning in our session. Um, nevertheless, I, I think we have covered a broad range today, um, a broad range of different aspects of the digital transformation in medicine, of healthcare here in Germany or in Europe, and uh, try to to summarize a bit during the following five to 10 minutes and to point out some key messages we spoke about today in the morning. And uh, first of all, I would like to um, start with, um, uh, we looked at how the digital transformation of healthcare systems is changing the medical profession and explored some of the most effective ways to ensure that physicians have the relevant knowledge and skills to adapt to this new reality. Perhaps the most essential of these competencies is, Professor Schmidtke just said, um, data literacy. 
and that is um, the ability to manage and to analyze generated, patient-generated data efficiently, effectively, and um, with the utmost respect for patient privacy. We learned that this concept is, unfortunately, not yet being already addressed in German medical schools' curricula, nor is it given enough consideration in ongoing reform processes like the 2020 Master Plan of Medical Studies. Here, we have to improve our own education, and we have to improve our qualification. That's the task of us. That's the task of physicians, just to improve our own qualification and um, education. Second, um, digital tools from medical apps to wearables to online portals for making appointments offer tremendous opportunities to enhance the healthcare experience for our patients. While physicians certainly aren't expected to learn how to program an app or to develop a data security strategy, it is important that they have the opportunity to gain experience with the digital tools at their disposal and to develop an understanding of the basic mechanism and, yes, even the dangers of gathering and processing patients' data. If the way physicians practice medicine is changing, then I think it stands to reason that the way they are trained must fundamentally change as well. Every disruptive innovation in healthcare brings with it the risk, the risk of undermining the mutual trust and respect between physicians and the patients. And this is something every, every physician has to keep in mind. Trust is a key message. Trust is a key message to hold on the close relationship between patients and physicians in future with digital medicine. Trust is a key message if you speak about the development of digital medicine. Health data is especially valuable because it often contains an entire lifetime of personally identifiable information. In the right hand, these data can save lives, but in the wrong hands, they can devastate them. And we, as physicians, have the task to hold these data in the right hands. And we have to be able to explain to their patients why a certain diagnosis has been made or why a specific treatment must be carried out. And we only can do this as physicians if trust exists. Trust between physicians and patients and trust in the technology. Here we can see actually how digital tools can improve the patient-physician patient relationship. Technology in medicine also raises important ethical questions we spoke about this morning. Some might argue that some forms of technology, for example, the use of robotics in surgery or artificial intelligence, could render doctors obsolete in the future. I do not believe in it, and I don't believe that anybody here in this room or in this session believe in this theory. Yes, it's true that digital technology has allowed patients to become better informed and more empowered when it comes to making medical decisions. And we should celebrate this. That's a fantastic development that patients have the opportunity to get better informed by using digital tools. But at the same time, we see ourselves how the flood of information we have access to can be overwhelming. It can even be exploited for harmful purposes, as we see with the anti-vaccination discourse on social media. This can have very real public health implications, bad implications. Patients will always need physicians to be a source of professional expertise and compassion, and it's our task to ensure that technology is not permitted, permitted to depersonalize this profound relationship. And yes, we can ensure this by building up the necessary trust. I would like to close with one key factor that Richard Charles Horton, editor-in-chief of The Lancet, highlighted in the journal's October 2019 issue. He writes in his commentary, a clinical examination is not 
only about eliciting evidence to piece together a differential diagnosis. A central aspect of a clinical examination is the establishment of a physical and mental connection between doctor and patient. Touch built trust, reassurance, and a sense of communion, and this forms the basis of any treatment, trust. The tools we have used as physicians have changed dramatically since the dawn of the medical profession, and they even change pretty dramatically from one year to the next. But without trust, these tools are remaining meaningless. As profession, Professor Orton points out, the avoidance of touch is bad medicine. Touch expressed through the physical examination communicants, communicates comfort and concern. Touch encourages cooperation. So, in my opinion, the key message of today, of this session, is trust. If we want to go further steps in digital medicine, if we want to have a successful development of digital medicine, then we need trust. Trust in technology, trust in innovation, trust of the patients, and trust of the physician. Trust is what we need, and trust is the main condition of a su successful development of digital medicine in future. Trust is what we need. That's, in my point of view, um, the key message of today. So once again, thanks a lot for the participation here in this session. Thanks a lot, Monty, for leading us through this session this morning. And thanks a lot for your attention. Yes, uh, and we thank you uh, very much, because I think this emphasis on trust and uh, on the mental contact, uh, which can be transmitted either by the direct touch or by the electronic touch, I think that was very important. Peter, thank you very much for your wrap-up. And uh, this brings our conference of today now to an end. Uh, uh, on behalf uh, of the German Medical Association and the Standing Committee of European Doctors, uh, I would like to thank all speakers uh, of today uh, for taking the time to share their expertise to us. I would expressly like, expressively like to thank uh, the German Medical Association and their president, Klaus Reinhardt, again for giving us the room to have this hybrid studio here in the Bundesärztekammer in Berlin. I would also like to thank the technical team that facilitated our event and all the people behind it, both in the offices of the German Medical Association, Ramin Pasa Passi and his co-workers, but also Annabel Seebohm at the CPME in Brussels, who helped us organize this. And uh, of course, I would like to thank uh, all our attendees uh, that uh, have uh, participated actively. I know it wasn't possible to show and answer all the questions you had, but uh, you know, uh, if you want to be on time, if you want to, to have a flow of the uh, discussion, this uh, very often isn't possible. Thank you, however, for bringing the questions to our attentions, and we will look at them. Uh, and uh, thank you all for having been here and having been with us. And all I can say now is goodbye from Berlin, or as we say here, tschüss, tschüss, uh, uh, and uh, have a good day. And those of you who are members of the General Assembly or the board of um, the CPME, will see, we will see us later again in the day. For all the others, I wish you a good Friday and a very good weekend. Thank you very much. This ends uh, the, the uh, event. Uh, thank you very much and bye-bye.